one. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Inside Movies Galore. Uh, I am one of your hosts, but tonight we are uh, discovering older and newer superhero films. Uh, as we are continuing our superhero month uh, here, uh, and uh, Dane has an exciting and thrilling film to uh, share with us tonight. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you have in store for us? Uh, yes. um, well, oh the film that we talked about in the pre-show was the groundbreaking, world-changing Superman done by Richard Donner in 1978. And then in 1994... And then in 1995, we had a film of equal world-changing <laughs> significance, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the movie. Oof, Lord help us. And it's, uh, <laughs> it's a beauty, let me tell you. Um, and it was the theatrical uh, film based on the TV show based on the Super Sentai uh, series in Japan with edited uh, footage and new scenes shot with American actors. And um, it became a phenomenon in the United States. And um, it I've did. Been, uh, I've been revisiting it in preparation for this. And uh -huh. it is shocking just how clear the scenes are. Oh, yeah. yeah. We, we, we kind of derisively chuckle when he says phenomenon, but... I can say for about three years there in the 90s, you could oh, not yeah. escape Power Rangers merch. It was everywhere. Yeah, I'm being I'm being serious when I say it was a phenomenon because it was. And like I was I was of that age, because trust me, like as far as um first viewings and everything, I saw this um so this was 1995. I saw it um when it first came out on VHS. Um and uh, so That's I was funny. like, I was the perfect age. I was like four or five at the time, like three, three, four, five, something like that. when I saw it and um, it uh, was just what I had wanted. Uh, Cause I watched the show religiously uh, from a very, very early age. And um, I loved it. And the movie was what I wanted it to be at that time, as far as like, you know, the same kind of thing, but just on a bigger scale with a bigger budget with better looking costumes than the recycled, <laughs> the recycled uh, American emulation of Japanese costumes. And if you've, <laughs> if you ever watch the, um, the scenes between the, the Japanese original costumes and then the American ones, like how the American ones have this weird, like white kind of turtleneck thing that the Japanese ones don't have. And like the, the look of Goldar is totally different. And it's just all <laughs> these little, all these little things that because they all got, you know, their own dedicated costumes and they had a decent budget and everything for this film, then you don't worry about those continuity errors or anything like that. Um, but yeah, it was everything I wanted it to be at the time. It was, it's probably one of the most 90s films I can think of off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I mean, so it's pretty it's aggressive been. about it. Oh, yeah. And I mean that in the best possible way, because like, look no further than the opening scene of them diving, right. skydiving and making that look like the oh, yeah. coolest thing of all time. Yeah. Uh, and the airboard, like, you know, him. Uh... Exactly. <laughs> right. it just, and it's set to Red Hot Chili Peppers doing higher ground. And it's like, you know, that's just could that be any more 90s? Like, where's their surge and where's their... Uh, yeah. I was going to say, you half expect one of them to catch a can of Surge and just yeah. down it, like mid sky dive. That or like their, their Crystal Pepsi while they're walking around with their portable CD players, you know, <laughs> playing, playing the latest Soundgarden song, you know, and things mm. like that. Um, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't perfectly 90s. It wasn't Nine Inch Nails. What show? Well, I mean, that now that would be fucking Later great. Time. I saw a movie called Classic 1999 that was from 1990, and mm -hmm. they had Nine Inch Nails head like a hole in there, uh -huh. and I was like, huh, that's neat. Uh, mm -hmm. Turns out that this was, it was made before, like, the band had been discovered. Like, uh -huh. the producers heard Nine Inch Nails at a bar and paid Trent Reznor a <laughs> hundred bucks to use the song in the movie. 
Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, they were they were uh, they were on the forefront because you know as far as like iconic bands of the '90s, they sure got that right. Um, but yeah, so that that was my first experience with the film, and I've watched it many many times uh, since that time. I never get tired of it. Objectively speaking, is it good? Not really, but at the same time, it's so it's such a mainstay in my childhood and it's such a if you like the show for what it is then it definitely is what you would have wanted from it at that time now it is not officially canon uh relative to the continuity of the shows that was established um no. from well from mighty morph and power rangers all the way up through I want to say Lost Galaxy, and then like once they hit Lightspeed, uh, Lightspeed Rescue, that was like the first totally American produced one, and from that point they just were able to kind of do their own thing. But they kept up a halfway decent internal um, chronology all the way up to that point, and um, ending with uh, Power Rangers in Space, which I would argue has the best <laughs> finale of any show. Well, Lost, Lost Galaxy came after that, and it was in that same continuity, and then I think it was Lightspeed Rescue after that. It did, but it wrapped up literally everything. Like, it wrapped up Turbo, it wrapped up whatever the other ones were called. It Well, they had, uh, they had Zeo, they on. had Turbo, In Space, oh. and then the... the the ones that I watched, I watched Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, which is hands down the best one. Zio was pretty. Zio was pretty solid. Um, I don't think I watched Turbo in Space or Lost Galaxy because by that time I, well, I had moved uh, to another part of the country by that time, so I was sort of, I it was up in the air at that point. I did watch Lo uh, Lightspeed Rescue quite a lot, and then. Mm -hmm. It was always just tough because it kept changing all the time, and so you never really felt like you got to know these people in the same way that you did with Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, which lasted for three seasons. And it's like, you know, that always helps when you're able to get to know these people. When they keep changing it up, it's like, oh, well, okay, you know. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, that was my first impressions. What about everyone else? Well, my uh, my little brother, so I had aged out of Power Rangers, Um by the time I think, well, at some point the show just got really difficult to see um, because it was on at like crazy times. So yeah. I remember having a lot of difficulty just catching episodes of it at all because um, it would be uh, it would come on roughly a half hour before I would get home from school, like bus wise. And the days where I would get home early, there was always something going on. Like uh, I was rewatching the show in preparation for this. Because I have the Shout Factory DVDs, like only the first two seasons, not the Titanic forty some disc set that comes right. in a Power Ranger head. I kind of want that now. I have the I have the complete the like the very first one that they did, um, the um, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers complete series set, like the the six case how many yeah. disc one. Um, I still have that, and I have it. I have it signed by. Um, uh, Jason, the Red Ranger, Zach, the Black Ranger, Billy, the Blue Ranger, um, mm. uh, Tommy Green slash White Ranger, uh, by um, the late great, um, I forget his name, something Axelrod who did uh, Lord Zed, and of course the amazing mm -hmm. um, Richard Horowitz who was Alpha Five, and uh, so mm -hmm. that's been signed by all of them. I have yet to get um, A.B. Joe Johnson. It was Kimberly, the Pink Ranger. And unfortunately, I cannot get Thuy Trang, of course, because she died in 2001, of course, very tragically. Um, but yeah, I, I car accident, right? It was. Now, I still need to get um, Kimberly, the Pink Ranger. I still need to get uh, Rocky, Adam, and uh, Aisha, who were the replacement red, black, and yellow Rangers. And... Um, they, uh, there was that brief replacement for uh, Kimberly, um, the, I forget her name, but she she would later be the Pink Ranger in Zeo. Um, mm -hmm. And I cannot remember her name because I, I don't think I ever saw one of the, I saw her in Zeo all the time, but I don't remember seeing her in Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, but she was in there briefly. And so I still need to get hers, but 
for the most part, I've gotten a pretty decent spread of the well, original cast. Well, anyway, of course, uh, back if, to yeah. what I was cool. attempting to say. Um, so, uh, where was I? Well, it was hard to see difficult. because it was... difficult to see. Uh, I remember specifically the episodes where they introduced the Green Ranger. Uh, um, right. I would always have a dentist appointment. Like, it's like, a, I've been watching it now. Uh, it's like a six part, it's like a five or six part thing. Yeah, and I could only catch one piece at a time, but uh, I was pretty into the Power Rangers uh, during that time period. Like you know, everybody was really into it, and I kind of most of the episodes I got to see were the episode were the second half of the show with the Thunder Zords and Lord Zed, mm. which is about where that's about where the show was leading up into the Power Rangers movie. Um, I actually saw this movie in theaters. I have a very, I have a very faint memory of it, but I did see it in a theater, and it was just the coolest thing of all time. Oh yeah, at the time. Oh, are <laughs> and, you kidding? Uh, it still is. <laughs> well, ironically, so I listened to God Awful Movies, a podcast where they just dunk okay. on really bad religious movies, and as a bonus, they do normal movies. And one of the episodes a couple of years ago was the Power Rangers movie. And so I thought, and it's like, yeah, that's not, you know, I hadn't seen it in 20 years. So I was like, hey, that's kind of unfair. And I listened to it and it's like, wow, was it really that bad? And then I watch it again and it's like, okay, they exaggerated some of this stuff. But at the same time, woof. <laughs> well, it's, that's the thing. Like, I, I will never... Uh, get after anybody who's like, I don't get it, or I don't like it, or whatever, because, like, <laughs> you know, you could have easily said the same about, you know, Transformers uh, at the oh, time, yeah. or any of the properties that were, that kids were really into, that were primarily made to sell toys, um, but they still hold a place in our hearts, like, you could say that about any of those, and so I will never fault anybody for, you uh, you know, not getting it or whatever because the power blaster and it's like fuck, I want a power blaster. Exactly. <laughs> well, I but I'll I'll never badmouth anybody for it because we're all allowed to like really dumb shit, especially like when we're <laughs> kids. So everybody's yeah. got at least one really objectively dumb thing that they will still go back to, you know, uh, every Everybody time. Gets and, one. At least one, and that one is definitely mine, because objectively, yeah, I know it's not anything deep or overly meaningful or anything, but I love it nonetheless. Actually, that'll be a good uh, segue into my first experience, because I'm one of those people <laughs> that you're talking about. Uh, I, I had a very different experience because of a couple of things. One... I was just like one or two years too late where I was <laughs> just old enough to where to me, it was more of a kiddie show when it first came out. Mm -hmm. And two, I was in that teen phase where it was kind of that angsty phase that you get into. And to me, the thing I was most angsty about is I always thought heroes that always win and are mostly invincible are trash. At the time, I, mm -hmm. I don't feel like that way now. But uh, so the Power Rangers, you always knew, I always used to make the joke, all they've got to do is get a boombox for the Power Rangers theme and the monster becomes powerless and they beat it up. Because <laughs> in almost every episode, no. as soon as the Power Rangers theme came on, except for the movie, uh, they always won. Uh, well, and uh, the Green Rangers uh, well, minis. That, that I've, been, actually, I've been paying I attention. To to that. They uh, summoned the... About to, they summon the sword. Like whenever the Megazord gets the sword, that's that's when the monster dies. Right. Except Golar. Golar is the one smart monster. Yes, the, they got it. He literally runs away every time the sword comes out. <laughs> so I will. Uh, I will. Oh say yeah. That the Green Ranger think the power line, sword is what does it. Mm -hmm. The Green Ranger storyline was the one that I did feel was the only one that had me interested because one, for the majority of that they were having a hard time. He was beating their, their asses for most of that. Oh, but then they got yeah, rid of the cool, yeah. like the cool sword. So, so one, he lost his two sword fighting technique. They kind of nerfed him on his power levels and uh, I lost interest again. But uh, <laughs> the way I looked at the movie when I was introduced to the movie was later on 
because a lot of the friends I have, I have a couple friends that are older, but a lot of them are one or two years younger who were the correct age when Power Rangers came out to grab mm-hmm. it. And they were like, you've got to watch this. And I'm like, Ugh. so I ended up watching it and not liking it. This time I tried to watch it a little bit more evenly, but I remembered something. And it was, uh, there were two reviews we did before. Remember when we did uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation mm-hmm. and Scrooged? And I remember Dane specifically yeah. had said that, you know, sometimes nostalgia is what is required to make a movie that's meh to bad into something good for some. And uh-huh. to me, this is one of those that really requires that nostalgia to make it good. I can't imagine somebody seeing this for the first time not having any familiarity with Power Rangers and going, this is one of the best movies of all time. Well, yeah. I thought it was well, a never, never a committed and Power Rangers nut. Oh, sorry. Well, I, I think this is where I can t- uh, tell about my experience. I came into it like mid, uh, in between like your, your age, Dean, that you did and the age that, you know, uh, Brandon came in on it. And, I enjoyed the series tremendously, uh, the uh, the original series. Uh, I'm not sure if I saw Zeo, and a lot of the space one just totally under interest me. And that's about the time that the Big Bad Beetlebergs came out, and I yes. thought that was actually going to. Uh, oh, I love them too. And I thought that the Big Bad Beetlebergs was a hell of a lot better, but um, I did not know that. These were Japanese television shows, uh, but way before then. Until like the last uh, a couple of times, I've been talking to, uh, I've been seeing the yeah. Super Sentai and getting more into the Japanese uh, uh, stuff. Now, I had actually never seen this movie, nor did I really? see <laughs> a Turbo. I skipped those because anything after uh, uh, after uh, Space just disinterested me. Well, that means, Space is really good. Had a really good ending. Like, I'm not kidding. Uh, that being uh, said, uh, that being uh-huh. said, I enjoyed most of the film. But it, it when it came to the part where they were supposed to do the Mega Sword with the with the new spirit a- animals, I just <laughs> the horrible CG. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> this movie has maybe the worst CGI yeah. I've ever seen anywhere. Like, I mean, actually, is a good I, reason to not like this as much. <laughs> I, I'll I'll give you one worse though. I'll give you one worse for CGI. Would have been well. Hey, I would have said uh, I'll give you one worse, which is Mortal Kombat one and oh, uh, yeah. and Mortal Kombat yeah. Annihilation. That well, has worse CGI. Mortal Kombat might have been better, but Annihilation was pretty awful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's definitely better in those movies. Right. <laughs> I mean, I'm no, not, I'm not no, exactly no. saying that the CGI right. is great in this yeah. either, but uh, you but know, no, have like, you seen Jurassic know. Shark? I'm including <laughs> Jurassic Shark. <laughs> I, oh yeah, I've seen that. That has the I, cheapest looking CGI shark in I mean, human relative, history, yeah. and it still looks about about yeah. on par with. Is, well, I'm, I'm saying like there, relative to its time, you know. Is like this it, PG uh, worse than survive than Pinata Survival Island? Oh, I love <laughs> Pinata Survival Island. <laughs> you get better that's effects with a Snapchat filter. Well, I, I, I'm, this will be a good time to back up slightly and reposition because actually, I think Brandon had a better segue into mine because I'm right in between yeah. Brandon and Dave in terms of uh, I think age and and what have you. And Brandon, your thing of one to two years, I think it's more like three years younger because I'm about two years younger. And to me, I loved the show when it first came out. I was really, really into it. And but part of the reason why was this was brought out, brought to our shores by Savannah Entertainment. Mm, And they were also responsible for the X-Men series. And I was a huge fan of that. So that but was that was probably my entry into this. And I remember one of my brothers in particular and I watched this a lot. And um, but by the time the series wrapped up, I had mostly started to lose interest. 
And I never had an interest in watching the movie. I never got around to it. And I never had any interest in the follow-up series or whatever. I do want to watch the rebooted movie just because of who's involved. But um, I thought it would be uh, – it was one of those things where, again, when you talk about your your childhood and your uh-huh. youth, like I've gone back to revisit those X-Men episodes, and they are so hammily overdubbed. And yeah. just it's really – you stack that oh, yeah. against – Batman series. The Batman series aged so much better. I mean, heck, some of the Disney stuff like Darkwing Duck has aged much better than the X-Men series has. Um, so some of this stuff is... Um, so I, I wondered what it would be like to come back to this after all this time. I was like, will this be something that's better left in my childhood? And... I have to say on first viewing that it was remarkably close to what I remembered. And I mean that mostly in a good way. Uh, It actually was cheesy as all hell. It did have really horrible CG, horrible editing, terrible overacting. It was so 90s it hurt. But it was Jason David Frank, right? It was cheesy good fun. Fuck yeah. It wasn't quite the same level of gloriousness of Velocipaster, but it was <laughs> oh, that's, that's a hard, we'll hard that's that. a hard one to top. That's a good movie. <laughs> but it <laughs> was like rock. in a way, it was it was cheesy good fun. You know, I got my drink on, so I actually kind of dozed off for part of it. But uh it was it was very fun to watch. But I will say, uh, uh, I will go ahead and throw out a positive and a negative. This being my first viewing, it, I knew by reputation and by name, I was familiar with the name of Ivan Ooze. Mm-hmm. I liked the character. He was fun. He's the best he part of it. And, and I like how going and looking at IMDb, uh, you know, and Superman, we brought in all these uh, connections to other films, and we talked about Indiana Jones for a bit. The guy that plays Belon in Raiders of the Lost Point is the guy that plays Ivan Ooze, and it's like, uh, on the one hand, you could say how the mighty have fallen, but on the other hand, you're (laughs) like, he clearly had so much fun with the role, um, yeah. yeah. So that was kind of cool. Brady Bunch but, uh, reunion. Uh, yes. yeah, he he but, uh, killed it. I mean, he was so uh, funny. great. Disasters from history. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. On the flip side, though, and this is maybe something Brandon was talking about. I think the fight scenes get really tedious. It oh. gets really. It's just the same thing over and over again. And I really yeah. started drifting by the end of the movie because they were so repetitive. Uh, it's, it's, it's true, yeah. but it also at the same time, that was kind of the case on the show as well. Yes. I mean, that was, yes. that was, well, yeah. and, and well, also, show, The you show know. fell very much victim to a lot of shows of that time, a lot of the Sentai shows. And a lot of the anime that were in that same vein, like the magical girl shows like Sailor Moon very much falls into this trap. The quote monster of the week trap Mm -hmm. where it's like each episode really feels like you've seen it before. It's just a different twist on it. And watched weekly. Exactly. But it's like, it's meant to be comfortable and familiar, but Oh, it's a pain to marathon. But (laughs) (laughs) well, as someone who's been, as someone who's yeah. been marathoning it, uh, I'm about 20 episodes into the first season, mm-hmm. and it's actually not so bad. Like, they don't always turn into the Megazord and just own the monster. Right. Um, well, they mix it up. Yeah, there, there are times when they, they there are times it. when they, yeah, there are times when they just join their normal weapons together and uh, blast them that way. Mexico. Which I always think that's kind of that, that's kind of neat whenever they do mm-hmm. that. Um, now, keep in mind, of course, that this was during a time when uh, kind of one-off episodes of not just children's television, uh, like Freak of the Week kind of uh, mm-hmm. uh, television, when that was common not just for children's programs, but also just for TV in general. Mm-hmm. Because uh, even though you know you had serial 
capitalized uh, narratives like the age of just binge watching that obviously hadn't been around yet. Um, if it had, then you mm. could have had more intricate narratives, which uh, not to get too far afield, but we talk about like X-Men um, mm -hmm. that did that very well. Batman, the animated series never really did that. It tended to excel in those one-off episodes, but that's also because Batman as a oh, character in general. Several, that was, that it was one thing that multi, always annoyed It did me. have several multi-arc episodes, though. So. Well, it had it had like two parters usually, mm -hmm. but I'm I'm saying yeah. like the, the one that I'm thinking of off the top of my head not just X-Men, but especially like Spider-Man, the animated series, that yeah. one had, after the first season, that one had season long arcs and oh, they yeah. tended to be pretty heavily interconnected. And that's part of what I always liked about the show on that's top of, dumb. on top of just being a huge Spider-Man fan because of that show. Mm -hmm. That's but, what I, um, um, that's what I personally really kind of hated about both the Spider-Man and X-Men show. Like every time you'd try to sit down and watch it, it would be part 11 of a 16 part <laughs> story. And it was yeah, just, no like, one incomprehensible. <laughs> right. I, I, the thing is, I Much recorded like the them. <laughs> well, I, I mm. recorded them, like, you know, religiously. And so I mm. I tended to love the fact that they did mm. interconnect and they did tell a big story. And I always felt like the previous mm. series, like those did. That's that's one thing I do miss about the uh, binge watch era is the previously on whatever show right. it's like a, there's always something magical about the, how seriously they take it but like the the you know that that was always a, that show did interconnect it very heavily which makes sense because spider-man as a comic is that way but power rangers like they for the most part you know there were fairly self-contained episodes and maybe they'd reference something that happened before but um I think that but that's part of why the Green Ranger one was so great because not only were the stakes really high, but um, they also they they did take the time to really tell a big story and they did it very well. Um, I don't think Mo and, has told his view yet. Yeah, yeah go let's, ahead. Sorry. Let's get his view. Oh no, no worries at all, man. It's been good conversation. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Saw this back when it was new. I think like my dad watched it with me, and then I ended up getting the tape. And I I didn't watch this a ton. I, this was kind of I don't know. I watched the show and I was about it for a while. You know, I bought the toys and stuff, but mm -hmm. I kind of fell out of Power Rangers pretty quick. I think, even though I was in the age like the age range to be totally ecstatic over it, mm -hmm. uh, and that's probably just because of other crap that was going on in the '90s. I was probably just playing Super Nintendo or something and didn't have the time to put to it, but. Yeah, um, I had the I had the Power Ranger game on Super Nintendo. Yeah, that's a good one. Oh man, I've played it so much. That yeah. fighting game is fun on Genesis too. Oh, the fighting game, Power Rangers: The Fighting Edition is like one of the most fun fighting games ever. Ivan Ooze is in it that is as good. a secret character. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's that's really cool. Cool. He's busted as fuck. I, yeah? I had one for you actually specifically because I know you're pretty familiar with Super Sentai and a lot of those uh, original shows, not the edited ones. And one of the things that kind of, I'll admit, drove me even farther from Power Rangers was seeing some of the original content because I liked it so much more. Now, would you be in that camp that it was that the original content was better, or do you feel like uh, Power Rangers did a did a good job upgrading it? I mean, for kids, yeah, it was fun, you know. But the Sentai stuff destroys it, dude. Like, <laughs> it's just so I much. Saw I ahead. saw an episode. I need to. I need to see the rest of it. I need to get the. Because there's a bunch of Super Sentai box right. sets out now because of Shout Factory, but oh, yeah. and I want to get I want to get them, but at the same time, like I did see like one of the Super Sentai episodes, and um, I remembered the footage that would later be used in um, Power Rangers, but I was seeing it in its original context, and I was like, oh, this is really cool because it's like watching the same it's like watching the same show again, but not it's a uh, watching it in its in its original context and you're like okay so that's why that's that way because uh rita repulsa i forget her japanese name but she's like an actual witch and um the oh, the rita. the yeah the uh well the the characters in super sentai they're like their ancestors like animal spirit guardians basically and that's why they're animals and um 
you know, it's just all these things that you're like, oh, okay, so that's why that was that way. Right, yeah, yeah, you lose a lot of the explanation of stuff with the simplification of it for obviously, like, a little kids in America. And yeah. just, you know, so, some of the personality in the different characters, obviously, is different because they're just splicing in, you know, American kids, whereas in the Sentai stuff, like, there's a lot of overlap between their personalities and like which ranger they are. And I guess they did that in a, in a lot more simplified form with power rangers, but you just get more of it. Some of my favorite episodes of the Sentai series are ones where they don't even suit up, you know, because every now and again, they'll do oh, yeah. like an Ultraman thing where it's just like about the characters. It's, you know, and them dealing with some dilemma in like real life, not their power ranger shit, you know? Yeah. It's sort of like how Voltron was as opposed to, uh, Beast King, Go Lion, and uh, Die Rugger, which I, I didn't never gotten to see most of it, I'd assume it. Mm -hmm. Because Beast King, Go Lion was much darker and had a lot of depth to it, but they kind of simplified it out when they changed it to Voltron. Of course, I have more uh, uh, nostalgia for Voltron, so. I remember <laughs> one called, like, Die King or something like that. Guy King, yeah. Die King. Do you know what that was? The, yeah, I know which one you're, I think I know which one you're trying to say. It's, um... Is it uh, Iron King? Iron King? No, it's like uh, Aliens Galgar, Galgar, something or other. Aliens attack Mount St. Helens, and there's a scene where a character is very graphically whipped. I'm oh, sold. <laughs> Let's yeah. do it. So, uh, I don't know what it was. Speaking of Rita, I have to admit, one of the things that I wanted to leave in my childhood is that voice. Oh, I love <laughs> her. <laughs> <laughs> so horrifying. <laughs> I, did, yeah, I mean, I, I, I did like how she was <laughs> looking at Ivan voice. like he was just like screaming. I, I did like how she was looking at Ivan like he was a piece of candy until he trapped her in a snow globe, and yeah, understandably that changed her mind. But <laughs> what, uh, <laughs> I love snow I know, globes. I okay. thought he said this guy was disaster and disaster. He's nothing but a slime infested jelly donut. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, someone shut her up. <laughs> Love that. Oh, that was good, but yeah. But, uh, yeah. Which the... Go, Go ahead. ahead. Well, I was going to say the actual plot of the movie is ah. that... Um... <laughs> yeah, uh, the actual plot of the movie is that uh, it was, uh, you know, 6,000 years ago, Ivan Ooze ruled the Earth with unparalleled terror, and he was on the brink of uh, building his ultimate weapon, twin machines capable of destroying whatever. And uh, it was... Yeah, yeah, the, we get that opening crawl. Yeah, well, and then and uh, Zordon provides the explanation, which he, uh, he was saying that essentially the first iteration, or er, er, an older iteration of um, Power Rangers sealed him away in his egg and... Uh, you know, then the chamber's been unearthed by Angel Grove construction, and they have to make sure that he doesn't get hatched, except that he totally does. And then, oh boy, you know, does boy, oh boy, do things go nuts because he usurps, <laughs> he usurps uh, uh, Zed and uh, Rita's throne, and he just goes about trying to uh, get his long sought after revenge against uh, mm -hmm. Zordon and oh, all that good stuff. Angel Grove is just such an unfortunate location, you know. It sure yeah. is. <laughs> Which is, is a hallmark of a lot of these series. It seems like yes. that one location just keeps getting hit over and over again. They pointed that out on God <laughs> Awful Movies. This is a city with a giant monster attack every week. And yeah, yeah. these guys unearthed this creepy looking like thing. You'd think they'd be like, we're not touching this. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I would really hope so. But the um Let's one thing up. that I well, one thing that I always thought was uh cool about well the the Green Ranger story arc in the show Actually, and what? I was gonna say they did rope it off and they kept people away from it. So I guess they did think about that. <laughs> they put a caution tape after it electrocuted that guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he does not and, get back up, by the way. <laughs> yeah, he's probably dead. Um, but the uh, the thing that I thought was really great about well the movie and the Green Ranger five parter. Um, what was cool is that they make it a big deal in the movie and in that arc that no one can get into the command center without a power coin. And uh, that's why it was a big deal that Tommy got in because he had the six power coin, which uh, 
Zordon kind of forgot to tell him about until it was too late. And um, and then Ivan Ooze is able to literally ooze his way through. And mm -hmm. um, the uh, in both cases, part of the stakes for why these two characters were such a threat is because he they both incapacitate Zordon in some way, which, uh, you know, here it's where he's out of his time warp and he's uh, going to be, he's going to die, um, which even then it's kind of weird that he's like physically there. And the whole point is that he is in an interdimensional time warp and he, uh, you know, is that's the only way he's able to contact them is because Alpha um, maintains that uh, connection and uh, but that's why, like in the show, it made a little bit more sense because they just sever that connection, and it, t it takes forever for them to reestablish contact. It, it mm -hmm. wasn't a uh, it wasn't a like preservation pod or anything. Although, then again, I guess you could make the argument that his physical form isn't really what's important. It's that maybe his physical form is there, and his consciousness is any who God knows where. I just and, love um, laying there I doing his best I ET he... impression, all gray and frail and shit. <laughs> his dead Yoda impression. Yeah, I'm probably uh, thinking about it too hard. but so. Yeah, I think you've put more thought into this than anybody involved in the production. Although, <laughs> one thing I will say, and I, I will need to back this up uh, because I have not read these yet, but apparently the, um, apparently the Boom Studios comics are... Uh, pretty damn good from yes what I've, heard. I've heard yeah, yeah I've heard they're great. and uh someone gifted me I'll the justice able... league crossover actually not that long ago well and that'll be really cool to check out because you know especially with the green ranger arc and some elements of the movie too it showed that when you have the stakes high enough mm -hmm. then you can make the setup uh really work and um you know, despite the cheesiness and everything, and I think the comics do take it a bit more seriously. But um, yeah, to. like yeah, like well, on a on a just story level, you're like, okay, well, their mentor is incapacitated, and especially with the movie, he's going to be uh, dying, and so therefore, you know, that helps to, to heighten the stakes, and thus, you know, create, heightens the drama and all that stuff. Um, so you could definitely see how that could could work, and um, the um, yeah, I, I think that that's part of why I think the the stakes work well here, um, which uh, I think uh, what what's neat about this also is that they they're able to use whatever leftover power they have to send them to the planet where they can find the great power, except that there won't be enough to get them back. So they basically just have to persevere because otherwise they'll just stuck there. I love I that. Done. Part, man. That's like so much like that uh, that particular part because it it, it kind of reminds me of like an Irwin Allen Lost World kind of a vibe. It's like they go into a Frank Frazetta painting almost. Like you, that chick, the way she looks reminds me of something that Frank Frazetta would have painted. That oh yeah, Which, um, big spire back there or whatever. We like. Go to a planet heavy metal. <laughs> Hell yeah! Oh, I love. I do love Dulcia as a character, and I think she's played really, really well. Um, like the, uh, I think that the, I can't remember who played her, but she really seems to take the role very seriously. And I think she, um, definitely is one of the stronger aspects of it, you know, even beyond, um, Ivan Ooze. And, um, and they ruin yeah, it by I, turning them into B-movie ninjas. That's pretty much. Oh, I love their, their ninjetti outfits. <laughs> I do too. I, I think me really and you cool. were talking about those <laughs> random multicolor ninja <laughs> movies a while back. And yeah, well, I <laughs> And, and keep keep in mind also that uh, even though they were intended for completely different audiences, uh, Power Rangers and Mortal Kombat came out on the scene at the same time, right. and they both were they were both martial arts oriented, and they both had multicolored ninjas. Um, well, they're both identical you know. in every way. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm saying they have more similarities than one would think, uh, despite one being extraordinarily gory and controversial for its time and the other being a merchandising machine, which, I mean, technically Mortal Kombat had its merchandising aspect to it as well, but it wasn't on the yeah. same level as Power Rangers, obviously. Um, I but, remember yeah, I, just, I find that I'm remembering the Nintendo Power ads with... 
that were like so real it hurts and it's just a guy dressed in a kano <laughs> costume like oh, yeah. throttling a yeah. child <laughs> yeah exactly but um yeah so but i think that's pretty cool and i also like it when they do get their when because this was something that the uh the series didn't have that i always liked about the movie costumes which i love the movie costumes in here i think they look amazing um but one thing i liked about it is that you actually saw their well their their zors their um dinosaur specifically or their prehistoric animal you saw it on their chest and then once they get their ninjetti powers and their larger powers back then you see their ninjetti animals uh, on their chest instead. And I thought, oh, that was cool, you know? And I just, I like that you got to see that and you never really did in the series. Um, I just feel so bad. It, I don't know why, but I like the frog. I liked them. Oh, I know, he got gypped, poor Adam. I liked them winged creatures that that, that went to the island. For oh, the, the, the Tengu warriors, yeah. yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, were, those, poor, those poor birds, it's like, one thing I like about Ivan Ooze is that he's really the only... We're going to have an easy time with the character section of this movie because Ivan Ooze is the only character with actual character. And <laughs> Ivan Ooze is a villain that does not mess around. Like, he... As soon as the birds fail to to stop them, he's just like, well, you're dead. And they all explode. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he just all those picks them into parents. barbecue, basically. He just kills them. I, I was glad well, actually, to see... Go ahead. I say I was glad to see that when they did recast the yellow and black ranger, that they did not choose to cast somebody uh, uh, who is Asian for the yellow ranger and yeah. somebody who is African American for the black ranger. I still uh, take really. some issue with that, man. When I, I watched never, that I movie. never noticed that before, but he does his after little, a while, little it was like, oh, he strikes his pose. Yeah, I didn't notice it back then. It would just oh, be I'm now. You would, yeah. And dude, well, didn't I, that I same it. guy have to do a movie where they made him dance battle a dude? <laughs> they did. Well, oh, they, no. Uh, well, here's the thing, like, because oh, I've right. seen um, interviews with... Uh, with um, something Jones, I can't remember his name, but he uh, uh, was uh, Zach, the Black Ranger. They did some interviews with him um, and because uh, they specifically brought up the uh, that whole thing where he was the Black Ranger and Thuy Trang was the Yellow Ranger. And he says that nobody, including himself, had any clue about that and that um, in the Super Sentai that apparently the Black Ranger was the Red Ranger's best friend. And so they were, I guess it was the fact that Zach was supposed to be uh, Jason's best friend, I guess. But, uh, which is its own kind of tokenism, I guess. But um, the, um, the uh, I, I think, that I just find that funny that, like, we would totally, um, oh, yeah. that would leap out at us right now. Yeah, Walter, it's one of those Walter, things that I don't Walter think Emmanuel, Walter Emmanuel Jones, that's his name. Anyway, go ahead. I, I think it's one of those. I don't think it was done with any ill intent. Oh, it's no, just it's one of those. Oh, that's unfortunate kind of. I know, moments, you know it like doesn't exactly it. A, doesn't exactly age well. But yeah, they did switch it yeah. up with the uh, recast actors, and then with the uh, 2017 reboot film, which I say, as far as taking it seriously, I think it did it pretty darn well. Um, and I there, love that movie. Like, I, I did too. I did not think it was possible to tell a good story with this concept, and the 2017 movie like nails it. It really like, does, it, but it, it's uh, so perfect. What they did was that, um, well, on top of having the kids face uh, real problems that teenagers in the 21st century face, like you know, sexting and bullying and you know, uh, emerging sexuality and family pressures and all that stuff. They have all those problems, but then they also, they really changed up the races like beyond uh, what they ever were in the show. Plus they, um, they had like, you know, Billy was on the autism spectrum and uh, you know, th these characters, they, they, you felt like they had personality traits that kind of got, retconned in you know they more, uh, which is, they were more like the outcasts uh, in their town and exactly of, they were that they, movie was heavily influenced by the breakfast club like the writers are on record with, yeah. with that hmm. well and and they were but also like it's not too horrifically on the nose about it either like it's just more the idea of these mismatched kids that 
get placed together by circumstance and they learn that they're not so different. Um, but the, um, in other words, like they, they were able to really grow the premise up quite a lot. And um, I mean, the, the personality traits that are, that were there in the show and in this film, you know, they were there, but they're kind of one note and it was more yeah. so about, you know, the, the primary casting uh, directive for the actors in the initial stages for the show was trying to figure out if they could do the, um, the either martial arts or gymnastics because it was uh, Amy Jo Johnson who had an, a gymnastics background and um, that was written into her character because that was her primary focus. And, um, and plus they were also non-union at the time. And I think that Saban wanted cheap labor basically. And, um, <laughs> you know, the, uh, and I, I guess that they still have that issue, which, uh, cause, uh, um, Billy, the Blue Ranger, uh, David, uh, Yost, you know, he, uh, has talked about how they still oh, need yeah. to be a union sh show and they still aren't for whatever reason, or he w or that wasn't the case when he was at Dragon Con uh, in 2017, but well, the, uh, the, wasn't the original Blue Ranger, he was gay and they were like, and they yeah. bully him constantly on set. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, that just tells you the differences between the supposed to be in the new Power Rangers that was supposedly from here. Um, well, and something bad, uh, bad happened and he wasn't able to go in or something yeah, like that. The, the, the only ones that were in the new one were um, Jason David Frank and Amy Jo Johnson. Uh, they had a little cameo yeah, there, which is cool. Yeah. And, and um, David Frank is kind of a kind of nuts, for lack of a better word. Well, he uh, he was totally fucking with us in the line when um, when uh, it, it was time to get signatures and stuff. But he was also really jet lagged, but uh, you know, it was. Uh, he's also a pretty fierce uh, MMA fighter. Um, he's like really tatted up now, and um, he keeps wanting that. He's like super Christian apparently too, and he keeps wanting to challenge. I think it's Jean Claude Van Damme to a fight. Yeah. Like somebody, or Steven Seagal. I think it's Steven mm. Seagal that he wants to fight or something like that. Which, he straight up did just challenge Jean Claude, like in the hallway at some convention. Because I that's guess that's right. Because I guess they have some bad blood between them. And uh, well, him him beating Steven Seagal would not be hard these days because I think <laughs> like half of I us think, could probably do I, that. I mean, I, I could probably say, do Steven Seagal. I think, I think somebody's grandma could. Uh, he like films from a chair. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, he's become job of the hut pretty much, but um, the uh, I, I think that the the point is that the actors here they did not come from a place of they didn't come from the the actor's studio or anything, but they were able to do what the roles required, and they became mega stars overnight, and they they did become, you know, childhood heroes and they certainly were for me. I mean, every, every boy my age, you know, wanted to be Tommy and thought that Kimberly was the fucking hottest girl in the world. And let me tell you, she was at that time. And she's, uh, Amy Jo Johnson's actually aged really well. And she went on to, uh, I guess to great critical acclaim in this, uh, I think it was, uh, what am I thinking? Flashpoint or something. It was like a, Canadian uh, police show, um, and she she went on to do great uh, work there. And um, you know, uh, Thuy Trang was actually in the Crow City of Angels uh, before she died. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I mean, people have gone on to do different things. And um, um, Austin St. John, who was Jason, he went on to be a um, paramedic uh, in Florida, I believe. And um, yeah. You know, so people have done different things with it, and I, I wish I knew more about what, like, Aisha um, and Rocky were doing. I know that um, Adam, who was, um, whoever, I cannot remember his name, but he actually went on to be a big, big name in anime uh, voice acting. Johnny Young and, Bush, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, name. yeah, he's a big name in anime. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, that's, and, that's the thing, though. It's not, I have nothing, I mean, as far as Power Rangers are concerned, I definitely acknowledge how much culturally, uh, how important it is culturally, at least to a certain segment of society, mostly to 
millennial, uh, the millennial generation and maybe the older Gen Z generation. But uh, again, it's, that's the thing is it's, uh, it does have that uh, cultural importance. I think that it is important for media. <laughs> the sad thing it is important with that gen that generation. <laughs> there is kind of a uh, sweetness to it, though. Like, because rewatching the old show and just kind of knowing where people ended up um, oh, and God, yeah. what was yeah. going behind the scenes, like it does, it does kind of sour it a little bit. A little, but at the same time, I mean, the show and the movie, it's like just depends on like how much it has a place in your heart and how much it like transcends any other thing which actually a um, couple interesting things to throw in there I think you could argue at least I could that the heart of the show and you know the movie to a lesser extent but the um, you could argue that the heart of the show really was actually Bulk and Skull like I thought they were I amazing <laughs> I loved them throughout the whole entire thing uh. I they annoyed me them. so much. <laughs> Are you kidding? Like I, I loved uh, the, I loved their chemistry together, and actually, it was um, Paul uh, Schreier, Schreier uh, who played a uh, bulk. Um, actually, no, sorry, Jason Narvi was Skull. He was actually a pretty classically trained actor, if I recall. And uh, they, um, they were, they were good in uh, this movie. I'm going to say that they were not as annoying in the movie to me as they were in the show. I agree. The show, they annoyed the heck out of me. <laughs> I, I thought they were hilarious. I, I, I thought them. they were funny. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. I like how well, they're, think... they're about to jump from the skydiving plane and they forgot their own parachutes. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody yeah, else I notice think... that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that yeah. Was so a joke, but at the same time... Uh... That would have been a bad oh. end to the character. <laughs> Well, it's a. Uh, I just. Fun. I I think that you could do a whole show about those two characters, almost like uh, if you want to think of it this way. You know how like Daria was like a supporting character in Beavis and Butthead, and then yeah. she eventually got her own show. It's like you could almost do like your own Daria, but about uh, mm -hmm. Bulk and Skull, and I and I love their theme mm -hmm. music too, which is so catchy and awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay. I've heard that they've evolved as characters as the show has gone along, uh, becoming a yeah. little bit more good guys and, and less uh, just uh, well, yeah, kind of stupid antagonists. Well, yeah, because in the Power Rangers Paper Force, um, Bulk uh, becomes a, the Yellow Ranger, the Harbor, For uh, Harbor Force Yellow Ranger, mm -hmm. and uh, it's an entirely different character. And I, I think it's uh, just really cool to just, I like it. Like same with like Flash Thompson in the Spider-Man universe. How he starts off as like this two-dimensional bully, and then gradually he and Peter become friends, and then eventually in the newer comics he's Agent Venom. Um, you know, which is pretty cool. But um, then the the other character that we should mention from the movie who pops up in the movie and never appears ever anywhere ever again was Fred the kid. Our token, mm. our token '90s kid, uh, you know, with an idiot cop dad, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, th this kid who has no development, no anything other than being your token '90s kid, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, it's just like <laughs> I find the whole like once they squirt water on the parents, and that's enough to undo the. Spell. Uh, and that's that well, really... They were using a fire hose. It's a little more than squirting water, but. Well, I mean, that oh, yeah. is what it is. That is what it is at the it's end assault. of the day. That's though. what it is. But, I get drink like, I just, the fire hose. <laughs> well, I just love the uh, how empty and hollow the I love you, son. At the end is and like, <laughs> and then they do that dumb shit where it's like Fred Kelvin, the Silver Ranger, and then Fred Kelvin, the Gold Ranger, and then I'm thinking. Uh, even as a kid, I'm thinking, uh, no, uh, Jason becomes the Gold Ranger dipshit, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just found that funny, and it's like, I wonder if that character has ever come back in any, like, extended media or I, something. I thought about that, too. Like, wouldn't it be funny, like, if that was, like, a callback they made at some point? Because I, I lost track of the Power Rangers after Lost Galaxy, uh, because I had kind of aged out of the show by the mm -hmm. time... 
Well, by the time whatever happens after the Thunder Zords happens, like, I lost track of it. Um, but my little brother got into Power Rangers, and so he was into Power Rangers, I think, Turbo, In Space, and Lost Galaxy. So that's how I saw the finale of In Space. Which uh, pretty much ties up all the loose ends from the show as I knew it. Like it, and mm -hmm. it's the end of Rita and Zed's character arc. And yeah, both of the other villains too. And um, but well, yeah, and it's possible for sure that you know they could do some kind of like extended universe callback because like they've they've done that with like. Uh, they did an episode of, I forget which iteration of Power Rangers, but they did one that was, like, Forever Red, and, like, every actor that ever played a Red Ranger came back. Um, and, um, you know, so they, they've done things like that, and they even had, like, to Tommy, uh, you know, well, after having stuck around for Zeo and Turbo and that kind of stuff, he eventually came back uh, to uh, Dino Thunder, and I guess he was like a paleontology professor or something, and he was the Black Ranger of of that show. And um, you know, so they they've been able to do some kind of callbacks, um, even though the continuity is relatively loose. Um, so it's like if if they could, uh, if Rocky Balboa, the sixth Rocky film, if they could bring back little Marie from the first one and actually make her a really foundational, interesting character in that film, and it's like, well. Who's to say that Fred Kelman couldn't get his glorious comeback where he finally gets a personality? Hey, I'll guarantee he's been a, probably a guest at small local conventions. It's a pretty common Pro thing for that. Prob probably, and he's probably got a he's probably got a much bigger line than you might think. Dude, mm -hmm. they had the baby from the labyrinth at ours one year. I still think that's hilarious. Like, mm -hmm. tell us about and actually. Labyrinth, you know? Well, one there's um, one uh, interesting. I know well, one uh, interesting oh. thing really go ahead. Oh, I, I was gonna say I know Tony Moran, the guy who's Michael Myers for that four or five seconds when he's unmasked in the first Halloween. I know that he goes to conventions a lot right. and has a very large signature. <laughs> and um, I'm sure. I showed I was showing off my Tony Moran signature to somebody and they just like went off. It's like you know, Deborah Hill has more claim to Michael Myers than Tony Moran. It's like, damn. Well, there, there were like autograph. There, you know, there were like five. There were like five different people in, uh, in, um, uh, in the mask in the Michael Myers mask in the first film. Uh, Deborah Hill technically spent. Deborah Hill spent, I think, technically more, like a couple more minutes, like as Michael Myers' hands in the opening sequence. So that's what yeah. that guy was going off of. But it was just kind of a funny sort of thing. Like, after having experienced conventions for the, fir for the first time in, like, 2017, 18, and just doing that for a while, um, you learn that everybody who's mm -hmm. there as a guest isn't exactly the biggest deal in the world. Oh, yeah, that's great. One the, year, um, the guy that it was just a guy that owns Jurassic Park props, like, doing a, a thing. And it's like, well, he didn't make them. He just collected them. Like, I mean, they're still cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to talk to you as well. Like, usually these people know. are like, yeah, here's how I got this. And they're excited and they're, you know. It's actually yeah. cool. Uh, I got to be like face to face yeah. with the baby raptor prop. And that's that was a highlight for me. So, I got so. to uh, I got to hold the machete from Friday the 13th Part 7. Nice. Um, that the guy who owns it like had with him. He also had like a like a shrieker head from Tremors Two, and it's <laughs> like, ah, oh, you are so cool. <laughs> one uh, one interesting thing to note is that two characters that were pretty foundational in the show, as far as uh, Rita and Zed's. Uh, little community of monsters, um, monster henchmen, actually three characters that aren't here. Uh, Finster, Babu, and, um... Squat. The Squat, yeah. They, they are not in here, and instead you got Mordant, uh, this pig creature that never appears anywhere else. Um, and I assume that they did that because, uh, that way you had fewer characters to worry about, I, I assume. Um, Finster was like my, interesting as, like, Finster's like my favorite. I was disappointed. I remember being disappointed he wasn't in the movie. 
when I saw it. As Although a then again, it's like then again, it's like, well, where could they have fit him in? Because I mean, the the whole idea is that this is some interloper taking over uh, Rita and Zed's territory, basically. So they wouldn't have really been able to fit in any of her monsters or or even Zed's monsters because he had his own a uh, bunch of uh, monsters that he did. But, um, yeah, I don't see how they could have fit him in. But, yeah, I, objectively speaking, yeah, I, I think he was... I always liked his voice because he always sounded very wise and not even necessarily evil, just more like he's just really good at doing this particular thing, which is creating monsters. Um, but uh, he always had a really good voice. And, um, That's the thing, my empress. Yes, e e exactly. Like he, he never really he never really seemed malicious. He was just good at his job and he liked doing it, clearly. Um interestingly enough, um not not in the movie, but in one of the um one of the episodes of the show was actually uh Brian Cranston did a monster voice, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I, um, I don't know which one, but I did remember that when I was when I've been watching this and I was like, Is this him? Is this him? Is this him? Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember either, but um I want to say it was the Terror Toad. I I'm gonna figure that out really fast. But um, I, I want to say it was that. I saw a Terror Toad, and it 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 could it could be the Terror Toad. The Terror Toad was like Let one of the cooler see. monsters. Yeah, he was pretty cool. But um, well, and interest, and I bring it up not just because that's interesting uh, trivia, but also because um. The character Billy Cranston, I believe his last name was derived from Brian Cranston, actually, um, if I recall. And um, again, this was pre Malcolm in the Middle, pre Breaking Bad. So, um, and he, he and in the middle, yeah, yeah, and he and he would later go on to play wow. Zordon in the 2017 film, which is cool. I want to know if he really grows body hair like his Malcolm in the middle, middle character. I always love that one. Lois would be like shaving him at the kitchen table. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so he, he voiced uh, Twin Man and Snizzard uh, in two different episodes. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I just saw the, that, I just saw the Snizzard. Was. Yeah, so that's that's who he was there. Sounds like what but, um, would call Sneeze, you know? Uh, he's, he, is yeah, a, so, he is a snake like lizard who shoots snakes. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he was. But um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think too, that I think I what made that? I think what makes makes the show at least for me was the well, the bigger budget, the spectacle of it. Ivan uh, is a as a fun villain, um, and uh, not to mention which we kind of touched on, but not in full detail. But the soundtrack to this film. Is hmm. fucking great. Oh. Yes. Really uh, <laughs> that's my favorite part of the exact film. As I like the soundtrack. I mean, it's shoot. a great snapshot. Even, of even hearing a "They Might Be Giants" track uh, play, which I was surprised by. I always love anything that has uh, that has "They Might Be Giants" on it because they're they were one of my favorite bands at the time. Probably the only thing that I would have probably oh, yeah. picked out. As a matter of fact. Uh, <laughs> of the film back then so it's kind of cool yeah and there's a newer one at the time since around was actually a yeah there's a lot of time. well there's a lot of great songs there like the devo song are you ready it's got mm -hmm. the power by snap uh the i have the soundtrack album and it's like it's got a a dance version of kung fu fighting called kung fu dancing mm -hmm. and uh mm -hmm. It, it's it's most definitely a snapshot of the time, and actually the Van Halen song "Dreams," which had come out in 1986, I think, um, it actually helped to the inclusion of that song in the film helped to um, kind of re, re raise awareness of Van Halen, kind of help give them a resurgence, which is pretty cool. <laughs> no. That's funny, like race awareness of Van Halen, like it's you know, so, so or, bring, or rather, bring them back into the bring no, them back into the public no, consciousness, no. consciousness, which and that was uh that was in the same year as the Kiss MTV Unplugged, which then brought back the original members of Kiss into that whole uh, resurgence of Kiss nostalgia, and then the, the their whole '90s era of 
you know, uh, mm-hmm. fame again. So it was definitely in vogue that whole, um, oh, for you know, sure. yeah. bands from the seventies reforming and getting introduced to a new generation mm-hmm. and all that. Aerosmith shit was regrettable and I wish we could go uh, back and do it. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, uh, I don't know, man. I just like the idea of like someone warning people that Van Halen's out there. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I know. A lot of music was embarrassing in the nineties. Uh, well, that they well they they had a good blend of stuff that was like older, but also relatively recent, and he even had the stuff like Free Ride by uh, well Dan Dan Hartman, and that was originally a uh, Edgar Winter song, but he was uh, Edgar Winter group in, in which he was in, but they had the version of him solo, and uh, that even fit really well too. So you know, it uh, has a good blend of things. There wasn't enough. There wasn't enough corn or nine inch nails. That would have been cool. That would have been. Some cool. of those fight scenes would have a whole different punch to them if we re- <laughs> did the soundtrack. No, no pun intended. <laughs> uh, if you wanted to throw some edema in there, uh, I wouldn't mind that. So. I liked edema. I actually really enjoyed that band. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the nineties. Kind of our, our nineties episode. Yeah, yes, we, we've actually talked about the the. So this movie is watching it again. I mean, you can't really say it's. I can't. I can't say it's good, but the memories of it are good. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. no, the memories like, and even it, if you're a kid, and if you're a kid, it's like you know you could do a whole lot worse. I think as far as like you know just basic you know junk TV or movies, it's like I, you could do a lot worse. I think mm-hmm. no. I know we've touched on it, but the big elephant in the room is, of course, the CGI Zord. I look at this, like, if this was a Super Sentai movie, it would have been, it might have been cheesy rubber suit, or they might have been cheesy practical, but they would have been practical one way or the other. There, There is a practical and, uh Megazord that smashes through a building, and you can definitely tell it's a practical yeah. like model smashing through a I building. Just, uh, why didn't they just do mm. for a series that utilized practical effects like that? Well, they didn't really. They utilized in other shows, but, uh, yeah. but either case, though, for a show that was talk that utilized practical effects, even if even if taken from somebody else, uh, as one of their big things, the movie really should have, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Gone all out and utilized practical effects for the Zords. Yes. What they what they, what they should have done is they should have done what the um, Japan only the the Toho revised uh, the revival uh, Godzilla films at the time, uh, like uh, you know Godzilla versus Destroyer and you know things like that. What they were doing because those were practical effects and they looked really damn good. You know, and the the creature suits looked great and. You know what they were able to do was like, yeah, if they could have done that, then you could have made that really work. Um, we should have no had quality of swords as we did with the suits. <laughs> See, I don't know well, why they, yeah, I heard better. like uh, Godzilla versus Destiny's Child, which that would have been a totally yeah. different movie right there. Uh, now that would have been a cool thing for the Power Rangers to fight. That needs to happen. <laughs> right. was originally well, supposed to be the devil. That's why it looks so nasty. Yeah. So Godzilla versus Destiny's Child, would that have been when they had four members? <laughs> there you go, and they could have had a backstabbing moment at the end or something. So yeah, yeah that would have been kind of cool. Though you see, the other thing Godzilla though I like versus that, the Spice Girls. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that the practical effects for that when they used them were not bad, and some of the CGI effects, like the costume design and makeup, were not bad, especially on Ivan Ooze. Yeah. So it just tells me it's like, well, you you have I, I see where your money went. And technically probably a ton of money went to the CGI because back yeah. then CGI of that caliber would have cost them a, a freaking fortune. A fortune. So they could have done uh they probably could have done uh practical for about even. So like the fight with the monster bones or what are the dinosaur bones, that's probably cooler mm-hmm. than the that kind oh, of yeah, that was really cool. You could, it, you could tell it was made out of rubber too, because the bones would like bounce. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That reminded me so of that's like part of the show, in my opinion. <laughs> the T Rex that was in Night of the Museum with Ben Stiller. Oh yeah, 
<laughs> well, you've also, you, you also got to love the, um, th there's quite a few cool things. Like you got the, the dinosaur bones, which of course this was very obviously in the wake of Jurassic Park because they explicitly mention, welcome to Jurassic Park. Very funny, Adam. You know, they explicitly <laughs> mentioned that. See, it was very much in the time period of, of that, but also... Um, Park was yeah. only a year old when they made this, I think, wasn't it? They might when, have they made, when they oh. made it, yeah, but it, it, yeah. It, it, uh, it was two years old when the movie actually came out. But um, oh, yeah. the... Yeah, but the uh, you gotta love the the look of those, but also the stone uh, guardians that guard the great power. Like they yeah. look pretty cool, and and the, and they were pretty damn tough because even though they had their ninjetti uh, costumes and they had their uh, their spirit animals to guide them or whatever, but they still didn't have the enhanced strength that they had with their suits. So I mean, they had to use their heads to you know, crush those things or get them in the water or whatever. And, um, you know, it's like that. And they were pretty strong relative to the other kinds of uh, creatures that they fought. I mean, even the Tengu warriors, they were stronger than, um, you know, than they could tackle without the the costumes. So I suppose I like that they utilized Tengu warriors, especially yeah. seeing as this was an almost all American production. Yeah. Suppose at least they weren't as gray and faceless as the uh, as the first creatures they came up against in the series. The putties. Uh, yeah. I like that gobble. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I do love the sound that they would make. <laughs> we haven't touched on the biggest highlight of the movie and the most nineties fucking thing about it, and that's what? Jason David Frank with his oh. elf big muscle shirt over a tank top. <laughs> and, his, uh, and, his pony, and his ponytail, you know. Yeah, glory. And uh, well, and plus, we I think we mentioned in the chat there about the um, rollerblading on top of the um, skydiving. Oh, yeah. Right. Which that that still has one of the best openings in any film ever, just because it's like that. Just is about it, like it's so great because it's about the most '90s thing ever, but it also. Uh, Establishes that these kids are cool. They're rad, man. You know, right. it, it definitely it definitely gets the energy level going pretty fast, which is that's always nice. That first you notice that. Against, uh, right. Go ahead. Uh, that first fight against the Ooslings, um, it reminded me of like some of the fighting and comedy that I saw in uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> yeah. Know. Yeah, there there was actually a uh, well, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles: The Next Mutation, that short-lived uh, live-action show. They actually um, did have a crossover sure. with the Power Rangers, which I want to say it was Power Rangers in Space at the time. But um, they did sure. actually have a crossover episode with them, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. and, but you almost wonder, you almost wonder that you're like, why didn't that happen sooner? You actually mm -hmm. wonder, like, with the 90s, what became cool. Uh, I mean, skateboarding really became... I mean, it was always kind of like... Actually, skateboarding became really, like, mainstream in the 80s. Or late 80s. I mean, Tony Hawk, uh, mm -hmm. Academy movies, well, things but it, like that. It didn't, then, like, it didn't launch into super, super mega well, stardom until, until Tony Hawk's Pro Skater came out. Well, that, well, I still say, though, it did in a way, because you think about it, everybody that was cool was doing something derivative of it. Yeah. Snowboarding, airboarding, uh, even rollerblading, oh, in my opinion, was a derivative of it. Yeah, Marty McFly in 85. Yeah, a lot of that stuff. I think that a lot of it came off of it, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Tony Hawk. Uh, of course, like I say, most people didn't think, uh, don't think about it, but Tony Hawk kind of really started his leap to stardom there in his Police Academy uh, debut. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and like Gleaming the Cube. Anybody that's a fan of old Tony Hawk stuff needs to go and watch that immediately. Oh, heck yeah, it's man! Like, it's awesome. Uh, uh, I I always like fell flat on my face with skateboarding, but I used to love to watch other people mm -hmm. fall flat on my face. At one point in time, I could cool. actually ride a skateboard, but uh, but after a while, after I grew some weight on me, then I kept tipping over. <laughs> oh yeah, well, I, I used could, to skate a lot, but you know, I could get over some speed bumps. I could do that, and I was like proud. But then that, that mm -hmm. was it. So I was like, I just like, you know what? I'll let the punk band I used to hang out with. 
they're awesome at it. I used to just watch it and, and be the one who had the tunes, and that was like the awesome part. Fuck yeah, but you're <laughs> right though. Like t that whole '90s and extreme sports was a crazy time for a bit there. Like X Games came oh, yeah. about, and then you had Tony Hawk Pro Skater, and then everybody got a pro something game. Pretty sure. Yeah. You know, pro Matt, surfer. Matt for Hoffman, Pro BMX, Kelly yeah. Slater, Pro Surfer, <laughs> David Mira. Uh, pro BMX, all that shit. Yeah, whatever, you, whatever that guy's name is, Pro Bass. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Pro ba Bass Fishing or whatever. Well, um, it, like, look at the soapy ad work back then. That's a great example of how that extreme sports shit just seeped into everything in the '90s. Like that lizard was snowboarding and yeah, doing well, everything. You know? We're we're leaving out one of the progenitors of of that uh, whole thing, which was Bart Simpson with skateboarding. For sure. Oh, there you go. Uh, 80s and 90s right there in that time it, period. Exactly. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, that definitely... I mean, I will say that um, at the same time, a as much as we you know make fun of it for being 90s and all that, um, mm -hmm. at the very least, that was uh, during a time when teenagers still went out and did things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We went to the malls and... Uh, right. Uh, I remember going yeah. once a month yeah. to the comic shop in the big city, which was kind of a small city because it's yeah. not really a big city. But uh, it was, you know, I remember doing that stuff when I was like a oh, teen. I was nice, a teen man. In the 90s. Went out, went out and mm -hmm. dug bears in the backyard. Yeah. I when I, I smoke at Southbridge Mall, so. Yeah. <laughs> I do think there's kind of an interesting parallel. There is kind part of an of interesting uh, parallel with uh, pr our previous movies of the last, you know, few. Uh, with with, I do think there's some parallels here with Encino Man, because in a yeah. lot of ways, the Power Rangers were a lot like Polly Shore. <laughs> they kind of came out of nowhere, and for a while, they were all anyone wanted to talk about. And then when they faded, they faded hard and fast. And then people were ashamed to say they were fans. I don't but know. We really I, go back and look at I, them. I, I don't agree with that because the Power Rangers uh, are still going on. Um, did Polly Shore, I have no clue what he's doing now. I, I think that fans of the Power Rangers will always be fans of the Power Rangers. Yeah. Yeah, I'll fucking fans of Polly Shore are not always fans of Polly Shore. Well, I don't know. I think Mike Dave is a lifelong fan with that one movie. Uh, well, I'll, like I'll go to my fucking I'll go to my fucking grave loving uh, Power Rangers. <laughs> hey, Mama, I thought you were gonna say Polly Shore. No, I, yeah, I've only I've only ever seen Polly Shore in the one drama episode and in, in Encino Man. Oh, I'm not so saying, Oh, I know I've not seen, uh, dead. <laughs> I've not seen I Biodome even... yet. I know I we I... on the character of Ivan Ooze, but did we mention who played him? Yeah, yeah. we did. Okay. Yep. Because he played, I remember him on Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right. So. Yeah. That's Slightly what we, different role. That's how we <laughs> that's how we uh introduced him. Although I have to say that even uh Ren now that we're on that, um even uh Renee Bellog as a character he even mm -hmm. um has his over the top moments i mean he even has yeah. like the, the classic villain maniacal laugh so i mean he was never really like a uh i mean he he has a bit more <laughs> he has a bit more nuance to him than uh ivan News does but at the same time ivan News actually um well to tie it into the movie that we talked about um <laughs> earlier in the evening was actually uh, tying it into Gene Hackman's version of Lex Luthor, who you know, is so such a self-conscious, you know, arrogant dickhead. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> that's what uh, Ivan is, is in many ways is like he, but the difference is that like uh, that version of Lex Luthor, like you get the, you get the idea that he, well, yeah, he's obviously very intelligent, but he also seems like he's essentially like a, a small town huckster who just happened to, you know, be just smart enough to do his thing, but not smart enough to get away with it. Whereas Ivan is like, he knows that he's powerful and you see the, uh, the evidence of it with just the fact that he decimates the command center and incapacitates Zordon and overthrows mm -hmm. Rita and, right away too. Yeah. And overthrows Lord Zed and Rita and gets to, uh, you know, get Goldar and, uh, 
the oh. pig person whose name I can't remember. Uh, they get him no, to they, they get them to really defect pretty quick. It was like Mordred something, right? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Because um, until you said it, I didn't know it either. Like I don't know if they ever actually named yeah. the character. Well, I, I had to look it up. Uh, I had to look it up. It was uh, yeah, more more dent. Uh, yeah, I had to, I had to look it up. Um, but uh, yeah, they, he got them to defect pretty quick. Hmm. I mean, uh, you've got a. I mean, I will say that as far as a, it's a, it's a kids movie. Yeah. I mean, if you if you look at that uh, as as what it is, I mean, even how they do it, it just stuck out to me as like, oh yeah, because he mentioned specifically the parents of uh, Springville will be the ones that do it. Because again, mm -hmm. what's a bigger threat take it to a kid taking away their parents? And, well, and they also kind of make fun of there. they also yeah. kind of make fun of parents because basically saying that they're sheep. <laughs> and, uh, you uh, know, in some ways it's like, well, I mean, the, ki mm -hmm. the kids kind of uh, as far as as far as like the things that like generate a bunch of toys and stuff, it's like generally speaking, those franchises tend to have parents by the balls, and so mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think you could argue that there's some very slight, you know, self so, humor there. One thing oh, I want to, one thing, thing I I noticed yeah. that I want to point out. So Ivan Ooze is able to bewitch the parents uh, by giving away like free ooze to their mm -hmm. children. Uh -huh. And if you look really co closely on the bottles for the ooze that he hands out, it says, mm -hmm. safe for kids of all ages, adults beware. Yeah. <laughs> that would be like a lot of, co that's a lot of products at that time. And and I, yeah. I, liked his, I liked his commercials. They were yeah. fun. But the old Nickelodeon, I mean, how Nickelodeon used to do their things in the 80s and 90s, that whole you know, yeah. this is a network for kids, adults, stay away, that sort of thing. I mean, and, it does uh, turn out it, the animated uh, series. Uh, it was more fun to watch at the time. I need to see that again. Well, and and the Nickel Nickelodeon slime, it's like just how much, you know, oh, how, much, how much uranium is in that shit, you know? <laughs> I love that part in the movie when the parents are all bewitched or whatever, and the kids are like having their raging slime party where they're just playing with slime and like drinking Seven Up and shit. Yeah, now, this does bring up one interesting blind spot in the movie. Uh, you've got, of course, our well, one in particular. <laughs> well, one in particular. You've got, of course, the Power Rangers who are teens, and Bulk and Skull are their contemporaries. Uh huh. But with this whole, all the adults will be bewitched by the slime, and it's up to the kids to save the day with the help from the Power Rangers. It makes you wonder: Are there no other teens in Angel Grove? Is it just kids and parents? It's yeah. kind of a weird little uh, combo there. What the hell? Skydiving are... service is taking minors up without their parents. That's what I want to know. Apparently, yeah. there was. A Apparently there was a cut sequence where Bulk and Skull would have fallen uh, bewitched and been his unwitting accomplices. But without them in there, it makes you wonder where all the other teens are. Because if they were there, then they could have been part they of these. Were, yeah, they were there. They, they were, were there. Remember? Uh, I, I don't remember. Yeah, they were there because they helped uh, uh, Fred. You know, he's like, ready. And then Bulk turns on the hose and he sprays the uh, in the original cut they were supposed to be part of the zombie horde i think so that yeah. was uh so they uh they changed that around but it also oh. brings up an interesting question of with so few teens in angel grove <laughs> how does no one miss six of them disappearing every time the power rangers show up this oh, is yeah. like a Clark Kent glasses thing, but magnified. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, well, they pointed that out on God Awful Movies. It's like, who are the Power Rangers? I don't know. Is it those six color-coded teens who start yeah. fighting the putties and then disappear and the Power Rangers are there fighting? Yeah, I mean, that's oh. yeah, that's that's pretty... I mean, on the one hand, for color consistency, you gotta give them some props. Right. But, at the same, but at the same time, you're like, how do the fuck does no one know that these kids are, you know, well, yeah, they, it, it, they made the joke on on God Awful that um, what if just everybody knows, but it's like 
an agreed upon thing to never mention it, to never bring it up. Yeah, we told us don't talk about it. They think they're good. <laughs> it's quite yeah. possible, but uh, uh, yeah, it's it's. If something... we acknowledge it, then we got to be concerned when these youngsters are <laughs> <laughs> into oh, these crazy. And uh, as a as just a shout out for a film, since it's a fairly uh, low, I mean, it's uh, not too big a documentary. Is you can't do that on film. If you really want to see something uh, more about like origins of slime, that's actually a fun one because they talk about you can't do that on television, which really was the origins mm -hmm. of uh, the slime. Yeah, Nickelodeon slime. Which that was a that was a Canadian show because I guess that in Nickelodeon's early days that a lot of their earliest uh, programming came from from there. Oh yeah, any fan of Canadian TV needs to watch that that documentary mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh or even something like uh i forget if it was goosebumps or are you afraid of the dark or maybe both of them but um the, the, a lot of those were um filmed in canada as well mm. but uh yeah i mean it, well it's actually speaking of filming in another country um this sh uh, movie was filmed in in Sydney, Australia, and in the surrounding Queensland uh, mm -hmm. area, and uh, it definitely they make that version of Angel Grove look pretty cool, uh, cooler than it ever looked in the show. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, it helps to show off what I assume you know Sydney brings to the table because it's mm -hmm. quite the uh, it's quite the city, apparently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been to Sydney <laughs> itself, and uh, it is quite fantastic. The Power Rangers fight off funnel web spiders. <laughs> well, we used to the use the Wilson spider. Dude, I'm pretty sure those kangaroos could kick the shit out of those kids. Remember, like, this powers are not. Remember, some right? of those uh, kung fu kangaroos, was it? Oh, yeah, yeah, the warrior of virtue. Yeah. Remember, this was pre-Hercules the Legendary Journeys. Uh, 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 where where they used Australia over New Zealand, <laughs> and don't forget Tank Girl, where they had those kangaroo warriors. That's right. Uh, I think, I think the point where the movie is absolutely masterful, though, is just in the absolute brutal onslaught of like puns and attempted puns. Some of them don't even work; they're just yeah. throwing them out there every time <laughs> they let you have it. it. I yeah, they're just love. going for broke. <laughs> One of the things that started turning me off uh, uh, from the Power Rangers, the series, was the fact that they were always uh, 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 that they were always sing so uh, so uh, songy and uh, I don't know Christian. <laughs> huh? <laughs> well, yeah, they kind of had came across as that way. Uh, uh, Jesus. Oh wait, what are we doing? Sure, why not? I I don't know. I don't get it either, but um, well, I could see them used as Christian TV, but uh, I don't know. They they didn't say any like praise Jesus type feels. Or Are you saying that they were like very Sunday schoolish? Or yeah, yeah. Sunday. Okay. There was well, always I mean, like a moral of the story that was pretty common for most shows like in yeah, the day. Right. Well, and especially like in the in the nineties, you eventually happy in their spe uh, speaking. Like <laughs> you just had to be yourself. Yeah. Well, right, right, you... My favorite, my favorite take off from that was how they ended Animaniacs with the Wheel of Morality. That yeah. was a great spoof <laughs> on that. So part part of okay, so part of why that was. And part of why it was there, even in something like Sailor Moon, which they had to really cobble that together because it didn't have any, didn't have any, pre any precedent in the original anime at all. But um, part of why that was is because in the 90s, um, well, you, well, you saw that a little bit in the 80s with some of those, like, you know, the G.I. Joe PSAs and the oh, cartoon wow. all-stars, cartoon oh, all-stars wow. to the rest, rest oh, of it and all that. Well, like you, you saw things like that where it was all, you know, children's programming trying to be more socially aware and all that shit, yeah. and then it culminated. Yeah. yeah, it culminated in Captain Planet, but then it was more, it was more specifically nailed down to where 
on whatever, you know, uh, weekday or week, uh, especially if it was in the morning, which I think Power Rangers is more of an afternoon thing, but yeah. for we sure, like he had, he had certain regulations that for oh, yeah. whatever period of time for children's programming that it had to be educational or have some mm -hmm. kind of something, or it was just in best practices to do that. And then on top of that, there was the whole uh, crackdown on imitatable behavior, which actually mm -hmm. Power Rangers as a show did um, come under a bit of fire uh, in the early days because of the threats of, oh, you know, kids will imitate the, the violence or whatever. Um, so that was, and, the, and they had a little bit more of a leg to stand on than they did other kinds of children's programming just because unlike a cartoon or whatever, I mean, those technically are real people doing those things. So, I mean, you know, I've never been a fan of the whole imitatable behavior thing as an excuse, but, but, you know, out of all the examples, you could make that argument easier with real people than you could with cartoons. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, that was uh, part of why that was there is because of, you know, that, that was what was in vogue, uh, at the time, mm -hmm. and I, assu I assume to various extents it might still be for children's programming. Um, but again, the, the rules for those things have been totally thrown out the window given uh, streaming platforms and uh, more of the, I guess, segmentation of what constitutes early childhood slash educational programs and what doesn't, you know, because oh, yeah. uh, it seems like those are more segmented now than they would have been um, back then, which, you know, one of the earlier um, kind of outliers on that front in terms of the TV rating system, which had yet to be concretized in the way that it is today. One of the early outliers for that was Batman, the animated series, because that was rated TVG which meant um, that it could be watched by kids, but it wasn't specifically marketed or wasn't specifically geared to them. And I, and that might've even been before TVY7, which is more common. Um, Cause like TVG, you usually see that for like something you might see on like the food network or uh, HGTV or something <laughs> like that. But I just, I found that an interesting distinction because that basically implied that, there was more of an adult following to it than there might have been for mm -hmm. something that was rated TVY7, even though mm -hmm. plenty of TVY7 things have had adult followings as well. Case in point, The Grim Adventures oh. of Billy and Mandy, one of my favorite shows. Well, shoot, My Little Pony. Uh, I'm not sure <laughs> if that's there, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that low even rate. Even though it shoot, causes that's... diabetes in anyone over seven. Uh, Jake and I both uh, both know people who are uh, very much into yes, uh, yes. My Little Pony. <laughs> oh Lord, who are I mean, over that age? <laughs> I can never. I can. Well, I I never even heard of My Little Pony until I heard of Bronies, and uh, <laughs> well, and I and I creepy. Well, and I liked uh, and I liked uh, Sonic the Hedgehog. Okay, I never was mm -hmm. like a. I wasn't like oh. a hater, and I wasn't like a Gaga fan either. But then mm -hmm. as soon as I heard about the interesting subcultures of the Sonic fan base oh, that, <laughs> that do tend to blend into the interesting That's subcultures the within the... Well, they tend <laughs> to blend into the interesting subcultures within the My Little Pony fan base. As soon as I, as soon as I, as soon as I found that out and all of the... Uh, well, it's weird. There's like a trifecta. There's Sonic fans bronies and furries and there's like a they, they tend to they tend to overlap more than not in uh, the various levels of uh depravity like, and no, i will give you uh, i will depravity. give you my little pony people the bronies are uh at least the bronies are very peaceful yeah i don't know how much sexual deviance they get into but uh, a uh, little I'm bit. sure there, there's got to be some, but you know, now there are some cool documentaries about them. I do have the uh -huh. documentaries. Uh, the <laughs> show was a bit too saccharine sweet for me, mm. but uh, I'm not going to say that other adults can't like it. Uh, I, yeah, uh, I can I'm see more, its uh, appeal to kids easily because it is entertaining. It's just oh yeah, saccharine sweet. It's, yeah, uh, it's it just diabetes. I think it's just more once you get into like sexualizing. Oh, sorry, uh, I should say diabetes. 
diabetes. Yes, I will give People you this. That, uh, yeah. Most of those that community is not about the sexualization about it. It's more about like extreme fandom of the show. It's well, for furries, it's right? a different deal. Yeah. Uh, well, so, that, uh, well, that what I'm saying is that I've known, yeah. I've seen plenty of people for whom the overlap is pretty significant in oh, all yeah. those things, and Rule and 34. within the well, yeah, and within the and specifically within the really perverse, you know, sexualization context. Oh, oh. I feel like the Power off topic Rangers here. bondage community. Uh, well, at the, <laughs> at the at the at the very least, at the very least, when we're talking about. Power Rangers and like the fact that part of the discussion. Get up well, there and go. Love after, at the very least, when you're talking about Power Rangers and you know emerging sexuality or whatever, like at the very least, we're talking about humans and uh, you know because I I won't lie, you know the Kimberly was one of the first crushes I ever had when it came to media and you know for 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 good reason. I mean, she was a gorgeous woman and you know has maintained her good looks ever since and uh you know it's just like but at the very least this was an actual physical human so i mean there's right. a there's a more direct <laughs> you know reasonable cause and effect there um yeah. and uh all of the crushes i ever had they were at least whether they were animated or live action at least they were you know humans and they weren't you know <laughs> yeah, they well, weren't a lot of game- some of the times the uh, anthropomorphized animals of our youth yeah, well, it wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't getting my rocks off with Amy Rose or anything like that. You know, it. Uh, yeah. I mean, not nothing. Nothing against those who. Uh, I guess I don't know. I, you know people like what they Every, like. I guess. Different strokes everyone, for different. Everyone's got yeah. their own kick. Different and, and strokes you know, for different folks. Pun and, intended. And you know, there's got to be like a Power Rangers thing where like people are like dressing up as the monsters and. Like, oh, I'm. Uh, there there probably <laughs> is, but it's like I don't know. At the, at, at the very least, there's at the very least you can see that there's a little bit more of like a relatively understandable cause and effect when you're talking about you know humans in live action. <laughs> Like I say, I think it's just that it's a matter of, you know, people like what they like. And uh, yeah, it's, well, and it's a kind of cool thing. I, I, like I say, I don't judge any of them. It might not be for me, just like Power Rangers. It's not for me, but I don't judge mm-hmm. anybody that, that uh, loves Power Rangers yeah. or, or even loves Power Rangers. And I'm sure I am sure if you explore uh, rule34.com, I am sure you got yourself an avalanche of uh, oh, Power God. Rangers related things. Uh, a, lot of bulk, it, a lot of bulk and skull stuff. Going you on. know, quite a few friends. <laughs> <laughs> Which I mean, I guess that there was kind of a, you could argue that there's somewhat of a homoerotic tension between those two. <laughs> Sure, why not? Yeah, why not? Actually, to be honest, like watching the show, I got, got I kind of got that vibe. <laughs> See, yeah. and I was like, "Are they huh, well, at the, okay?" At the, at the very least, a bromance, you know. Well, I mean, oh, yeah. the police officers and in, uh, in Gravity Falls, they're uh, they're mm-hmm. a couple. <laughs> so hey, you know, it's a. Uh, well, and uh, one well, and Bert and Ernie yeah, and. That's well, and even old. even uh, SpongeBob got officially uh, labeled as gay by Nickelodeon recently. Oh, well, oh. Uh, well I mean, we already knew. I know, but you know, they 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 were not coy about it anymore. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. No pun intended with coy and the fact that he's a fish. <laughs> I was gonna say he's not coy. Sponge is a fish. Yeah. Get your biology right. Or he's a, you know, he's a sea sponge, I guess, which is yeah. a marine dwelling animal. Well, he really is not a marine either. Anyway, he's like, like a sponges before. It's not. Yeah, he is. He is a. He is a sea sponge, but yeah, he's designed after a kitchen sponge. <laughs> So we're but we're debating about the exact makeup of a walking, talking, buck toothed, suit wearing sea sponge. Love finds a way, man. If if sea sponges are your thing or ponies or whatever. 
Well, at the very least, he's squishy, you know. Well, and koi is the Japanese word for love. You know, it so is, and it's go. and it's and it's a fish. <laughs> You see, oh, there okay. we go. It ties all together. I think we're losing our, uh, our focus now. And our Bulk and Skull, My Little Pony, Sonic the Hedgehog, uh, uh, Which SpongeBob, uh, romantic comedy. David in the <laughs> chat just now, he sent us the poster for a Power Rangers, uh, Brazier's, uh, uh, Br Brazzers, Brazzers, uh, porn parody. <laughs> and then I, I also. I actually think that's a good segue. Talking, talking about Sentai okay. series and whatever. The one thing I will give this, I actually have a very short, authentic uh, Sentai series from Japan. I think Brandon has a copy of it, too. Mm -hmm. It was really cheap on right stuff. And it's called Akibalian Battle Maidens of Akihabara. Oh, yeah. Five episode series. For all intents and purposes, it, it aired on a pay-per-view equivalent of Skinamax, basically. <laughs> it's basically Graver Idol's doing Sentai stuff. <laughs> and but the only Japanese thing that's that good about it is the eye candy. It's boring as hell. But it's <laughs> interesting to know there is officially produced stuff out there that's kind of in that gray zone where it's not going yeah. all the way. Uh -huh. Brandon it's over not... here wondering about the, the, the Ranger love and he's sitting on some soft core Ranger action himself. <laughs> well, and, oh, yeah. and we're not even, we're not even, uh, we're not even talking about the, uh, the wood rocket uh, production, mighty muffin pounder. Ranger. Oh my God. I didn't <laughs> know it existed, but I suspected. Yeah, Mighty Muffin Pounder Rangers, which they I know. And they had already you know the guy they, who writes those from on Twitter too. Oh god! Well, they they had already cool. done uh, they'd already done Ten Inch Mutant Ninja Turtles, and he is very proud of it. Yes. I, well, and what's oh. what's funny is that if you've actually seen the costumes for the they turtles and April costumes. Hill. Everything else is like nightmarish, but the well, costumes that's, themselves are pretty good. That's what I mean. Like they're and actually their April O'Neil looks accurate as well. And it's like Well, well I mean that is April O'Neil. Like, I know. The, well, the yeah. actress's name is apparent well apparently that I mean that's, I doubt that's, that's her why real name. Her name like it, Yeah. Well, but like the the point is like costume wise, you know, hair style, color, uh, everything like that, it all looks correct, um, and it's like, hey, that's cool. Um, <laughs> so you you can you can do it more accurately than even the big budget movies can. And then that's that's your that's your inspirational quote, kids. Yeah. I think okay, this is a good, uh, a good segue to get into the uh, fi favorite themes, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think my my favorite. Oh, oh, he's showing it. No, Sentai, no, this is a different series, but this is a Sentai Magical Girl series that's all about these people fighting to save people's fetishes from alien attack. Okay. <laughs> it's great. Actually, why not? <laughs> I have a I have a suggestion for a favorite scene. Uh, Why don't we say our favorite scene from the movie and our favorite Sentai based series? Okay. It could be Power Rangers. It could be Super uh, Sentai. It could be anything, but it would just be kind of fun to throw out there. Or Akabelian and Jacob's. Case, you know. <laughs> no, <laughs> not that one. Well, I mean, my my experience with the other Sentai related things is not as great, so I may have to. Uh, abstain from that or i might even okay i'll say my say power rangers <laughs> well that well i know but i mean i actually just to be different i might say well my favorite moment from the film but also my favorite moment from the show because i didn't know the show very well so um favorite yeah. moment favorite moment from uh from the show would definitely be well there's a lot of them from the green ranger arc but i think my favorites are whenever I see Tommy being evil in and out of costume, as well as um, I want to say it was like at the beginning of the fifth, f five out of five, at the very last of that episode, when it really does seem like all hope is lost, uh, like for good this time. And uh, that's, uh, that's where I am on my watch. Like, yeah, Tommy just destroyed the Zords. Yeah, it's like they, they have like next to nothing left. And it's like that. That's a really good. Yeah, that, like as far as drama goes, like that's 
pretty much the the high point of the series from what I can remember. But um, <clears throat> for this movie, um, whew, so many good moments. Um, I mean, I think as far as like setting the tone right away and getting the energy level high uh, right away, I think skydiving is one of the like I'm I'm serious. One of the better openings in a movie I've seen, just because it does really set the tone and gets the energy level high very quickly. Um, and it always stuck out in my mind. Um, but I think there's that. But also, um, I really liked the uh, nighttime construction site fight when they're in costume. I think that w- they were able to do things that they didn't do in the series because they. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't they always fight in the daytime on the show? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I, I can't mean, think of a time when they didn't, but it was like, in an industrial area where the yeah. background would uh where the background would shift to include Japanese buildings. Yeah, which yeah. I mean, uh I just I think that the well, I'm a big fan of fight scenes that take place at night and they kind of are a little creepy looking and so in this, I mean, you know, it, Power Rangers isn't exactly, you know, dark and creepy, but uh, out of all the fight scenes I've ever seen with the shows, movies, whatever, I think that one um, definitely stands out just because they never did anything like that in the show uh, ever. Uh, well, my my favorite uh, scene uh, from the movie is the one where the father pulls up and I find out that they're playing They Might Be Giants out of the car. Uh, that was like that got my attention so that that's like my favorite scene of the uh, movie uh as far as the show i actually liked the original part where the power rangers were thoroughly beaten by the green ranger which was kind of their first like handed defeat and that resonated from me uh from my teens uh so that's actually the only arc I can still watch and not go ugh uh <laughs> and uh the uh the uh, as far as a Sentai show suggestion, I would suggest an anime series called The Shinesman, which is a two episode parody of Sentai and Power Rangers, where you have an office based uh, Power Ranger team and they have uh, office based equipment. Like one of them really loves his uh, his car. Uh, one of them has a, a fetish for little girls. Uh, one of them is just like, <laughs> and they use attacks like a uh, business card cutter. And uh, when they tell the, when the bad guys are leaving, it says, uh, Rena, get in the green square. <laughs> it's just, uh, just uh, to me, it's just one of the most uh, hilarious uh, shows based off of that sort of thing I've seen. And that's been Sounds a while. very Japanese indeed. You know, for me, uh, I think it's not necessarily one scene, but it's just kind of a montage of all of Ivan Ooze's moments. Because Ivan Ooze gets a lot of moments, like, you know, trashing the command center, the things I've missed, the Spanish Inquisition, the Black Plague, the Brady Bunch reunion. I mean, yeah. when I think of this movie, I remember that. And then there's also, like, a little moment, like, much later on, uh that I didn't even remember was in the movie until I saw it this time. He's just like overseeing the construction site and he's like, I'm bored. Yeah. You dance. Yeah. Do the wave. I <laughs> forgot like, what how is this movie. What? I forgot how slow parents are. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Hey, you dance. <laughs> Do the swim. You have like a uh, thing. Do you have like a Sentai uh, show suggestion for us all or movie? Um, I don't really know what that is or like a Power uh, Rangers type show, uh, or it could be Power Rangers if that's the only one you're familiar with. Can I say Ultraman, even though I've maybe seen one episode in exactly thirty years? Oh, wow. yeah, there you go. I mean, that's a Tokusatsu. It's in that that genre so I mean, oh what's the difference well if you want to broaden it past super sentai specifically then sure you know you could put that in there yeah. there are there are monsters that get punched that's <laughs> that's they more do. than enough <laughs> and how <laughs> and one could go back to that in common rider like as sort of like the birth of the uh, power rangers in some ways mm-hmm. or hey if we want to broaden it we could do Supida man 
Oh yeah, <laughs> even better. Because without yeah. that, there wouldn't be Super Sentai or Power Rangers. Uh, true Power enough. Rangers. That was freaking awesome. <laughs> Fine, I'll okay. say Power Rangers then. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess it'll make you guess, nerds happy. I guess. I guess. <laughs> Pot calling the kettle black. Um, I guess technically Ultraman came, like, wasn't that like 60s when that first started? Um, could be wrong about that, but... Um, That's a fairly old series. Yeah, well, I mean, I know that without Spider-Man, um, that, yeah, that that was still pretty oh, yeah. instrumental uh, for... It all goes back to Godzilla in the end. <laughs> oh, yes, which goes back to the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Right. Way to bring everybody down, Dane. <laughs> it's, it's, what, it's, what I do, <laughs> it's what I do best. <laughs> All right. Ultraman started in 1966. Yeah, I mm -hmm. thought so. Okay. So, I guess I'll go ahead next then. Uh, I, I, my favorite scenes pretty much were some of the ones that Ooze was in. D uh, Dustin pretty much already mentioned my favorite part where he's talking about all the disasters he missed, but there were a few good ones. Um, but flipping through the quotes, I did see one other part I like, which was the tail end of Dane's favorite, where, when they get down from the skydiving. And one of, one of them's randomly like, hey, has anyone seen Bulk and Skull? Well, Ernie's serving a free dessert with lunch. They probably landed on the roof. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they cared that. so much for their friends. You could tell. But <laughs> well, they're not friends friends with Bulk and Skull. They tolerate Bulk and Skull. Right. Like Bulk and Skull are more antagonists throughout the series. Right. Well, they're, they're kind of the, to, to use a Dane quote, uh, Dane Cook quote, or Dane Cookism, they're basically the friends that nobody likes. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. The, uh, they're, 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 they're the duffs of the group, right? You yeah, know? exactly. <laughs> well, and Squiggy both. from Laverne and Shirley. <laughs> But um, I, yeah. Now, as far as Sentai stuff goes, I mean, I'm I'm pretty well serious when I say that, like, pretty much going to be the Twin Tails a mashup of a Sentai and a Magical Girl. They're really okay. two sides of a coin. And um, but if you're talking like to broaden it in a different sense, uh, I think we could also talk about Monster of the Week series. There's actually one that I'm going to put forward if we keep doing our anime discussions. I'm going to strongly suggest eventually that we watch Jujoko Shoujo or Hell Girl. Hell Girl oh, is yeah. a phenomenal show. It oh, takes yeah. that and flips it on its head where the monsters of the week are actually the ordinary humans and the quote unquote monsters are the ones that are Hell Girl Dealing kills a lot of people that don't have it coming, though. I didn't like Hell Girl. Yeah, some of them didn't, but some I've of them I've seen like did. 80 episodes of it. I was not a fan. Well, okay. I saw... Well, that's probably about what I saw. It does go down off a cliff in the second and third seasons, but... <laughs> oh, yes. I only, but, yeah. uh, I only watched it because I had... Mm -hmm. uh, I used to check Goodwills for movies, and mm -hmm. I found six volumes of the DVDs at Goodwill. That's not bad. So I bought yeah. them like to sell, so I had to watch them all. <laughs> and I, I was, I very strongly disliked it. <laughs> Sorry, dude. <laughs> uh, hey, I, the worst thing I could say is it did get a little repetitive because of the Monster of the Week format. But oh yeah, my god, yes. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> It's like I'm a little girl. I I want to summon Hell Girl to take away the doctor who killed my puppy. It's like yes, yes. I will take him to hell, and then you will go to hell too. Or it's like <laughs> haha, I'm a business yeah. lady, and I want to Hell Girl to kill my innocent rival. I will right. happily kill this rival and take them to hell, even though they've done nothing wrong. It's right. like what the fuck? Like uh, I hate that show. I liked it because it showed the ugliness of people that are willing to. Well, wish yeah, to I've got to say the people that people. go to to go to heck yeah. in the series, uh, though I've not seen it. From what I recall, it's not about the people deserve to die. It's about the uh, fact that uh, it's about yeah. what people think. Uh, I can think of quite yeah. a few people who would want uh, certain politicians of any type to uh, <laughs> be dragged directly to 
heck of all uh, parties, and uh, it would be you would have at least one person going, "No, those are saints. We need to keep them in, in here." Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's not uh, Sam Raimi's "Drag Me to Hell" because that's uh, quite well, literally that's people be, that's wow. people quite literally being dragged into hell, or at least I they hate that movie. Movie. No, it is. It is. They quite literally are dragged. Well, yeah, more or less. It has the most obvious ending of all time. Like, yeah. Lord, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's in the uh, it's in the title, <laughs> but I mean, it's I yeah. don't know. I was I thought it was fun because it's you it's know a fun movie. It, it was Sam yeah. Raimi getting back to his Evil Dead roots, right. basically. It did have the goat scene. <laughs> and, I like the uh, I like the had... I like the leading lady in it too. I thought she did really well. Right. So who has oh, a it does that thing where it tries to surprise you and then does exactly what you think it's going to do. Like, I, I always hate that in movies. Like, if it's like, no, we're going to have a twist. Haha, <laughs> surprise, the twist is there is no twist. It's like, fuck you. Oh, yeah, if you're going to go with it, like, at least get creative. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, man. Probably there's no one favorite moment in this movie for me. I think just the sheer level of commitment to putting puns in as often as possible, <laughs> whether they work or not, is probably the most endearing thing for me anymore. Like, these guys just don't give a fuck. They're throwing them out there, like, just rapid fire the entire movie. <laughs> and I, I, I just want to watch it again just to, like, memorize some of them, you know, because they're terrible. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. Probably just that fight with the dinosaur bones. That's probably my favorite moment in the whole movie. And just the scenery when they went in to meet the Frank Frazetta painting lady. I forget her name. Dulcia. Yeah, that, Dulcia. There you go. Yeah, that just the whole scenery there. He was yeah. wearing so he was wearing like so not enough clothes that my mom like was really bothered by it. <laughs> I, oh, I thought she was really, I think she did a great job, like, acting-wise, and she she certainly looked great. Like, she uh, looked like she belonged in that world. Like, she could have easily been in, like, uh, in Heavy Metal, the, the movie slash, you know, magazine. Um, or even that, in, yeah. Yeah, like that, oh, or like even, that. like, in Death Stalker or something like that, you know. The so, Beastmaster. Like yeah. That? Did you have like a Sentai show that you could recommend to us to watch? Oh, did definitely Chojin Sentai Jetman. That's that's my favorite. If I had to pick, it's one that we didn't get adapted over here too, so it will be new for anybody that's familiar with Power Rangers. And it's just it's you know it's it's darker in tone. It's got a lot of adult content to it. They do kind of like an Ultra Q Ultraman thing sometimes, where it's like almost a horror episode. So that's oh, cool. that's a lot of fun too. Uh, it's definitely if you grew up on Power Rangers and you want something that's like darker and more adult, but still true to that authentic flavor of that stuff, because it is, you know, it's just one that we didn't get over here. So check it I out. Need it's something awesome. What's up? <laughs> I need to have something awesome for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really good Famicom game for that, too. Actually, quite a few really good. Uh, Sentai games on Famicom. So if you're into, you know, playing translated Japanese games, it's something to look look into. I'm tempted to hook my uh, my Wii has an emulator on it for all those Super NES games, and I've been so tempted to like dig it out, hook it up, and play the Power Rangers the movie any Super NES game. Do it. You won't regret it. And you know, I'm yeah, I am. Yeah, I have a. My my SNES has been hacked to will have ROMs from NES, SNES, Genesis, all the Game Boys, uh, all manner of things, and I do have Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the the movie, the Fighting Edition, got all those on there, and it's really cool. You know, fun. I'm gonna break out my emulator for that. <laughs> fun thing about the uh, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers game that uses the characters from the original show. Uh, mm -hmm. Each monster has a weakness to a different Power Ranger weapon, mm -hmm. uh, and so there is like a correct, there is like like a correct play order to easily clown each boss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although, from what I remember, they use the exact same character model, but they just color it differently, regardless of if it's one of the Girl Rangers or not. <laughs> Girl Rangers have different models, I think. 
No, I, I thought they were on the same. Well, there's a couple different Power Rangers games on. Uh, I, I'm thinking of like the very first yeah, one. one. Yeah, I, yeah, I know the one I'm thinking of too. The girls are all cut and stuff, like just super buff, like the dudes. Uh, oh yeah, that's that's that's, that's, the right. think, that's the one I'm thinking. That's the one I'm thinking of. But the um, well, interesting to note that in interesting to note that in. Super Sentai is your ranger, which this, you know, which they got the footage from that. Interestingly enough, the pink ranger in that show, um, that was the only one that was a girl. The yellow ranger was a guy, and that's why he doesn't have that skirt that um, the pink ranger has. Um, but they didn't really, uh, they didn't really translate over when they did Power Rangers. They had uh, the yellow ranger was a girl too. That's interesting. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Hunter Park. I think. Just a dude like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're the last one, Dave. Take well, home. Um, I guess if I had to cho uh, choose a, a Super Sentai uh, a, a thing, I'd uh, I'd choose a Common Rider. Um, oh heck yeah! Classic just for the, right there. Uh, just for the simple fa uh, fact that uh, it predated Super Sentai. Um. And it was the first. Uh, it, it was. It was the first one that I had come acro uh, across, other than uh, than um, Power Rangers, that had some, uh, uh, you know, something to do with, with like the origins and, um, uh, but, um, um, yeah, that's that's the one that I would put out there for people. So. Um, oh. Also available on Tubi at the moment, if I remember right. Mm. So very easy <laughs> to watch if you want to check it out. Mm -hmm. So, other than that, shall we give our outros? Go sure. For it. I'm uh, Dustin, also known as the Crypt of Horrors or Dura Cryptaxis on Twitter. I collect anything related to horror and show it off on my YouTube channel, which I think we just had a couple uh, new videos drop uh that's at the crypt of horrors and my instagram collection also the crypt of horrors which i really need to get off my button update since there's literally nothing to do uh all day every day uh, uh, check out that jaws one that's awesome where you compared mm -hmm. the uh steel book and the uh regular release that was uh, well sure worth it right there i'm pretty sure it's exactly the same thing mm -hmm. uh, which is why i think it's cool that you, you were showing it off so people can take a look at it yeah, I do need to actually open up the Jaws 4K, um, because I'm I'm still because I'm so sure it's like similar, and I've been I've actually been advised by somebody who has it open. It's like yeah, it's the same thing. Don't 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 bother. Like yeah. I'm I'm almost tempted to return my Jaws 4K because it's like, do I actually need it if I have the old media book? So that's why I haven't opened it yet. But hey, it's pretty cool. So I'm probably mm -hmm. keeping it and selling off the media book. Hmm. Um, and then uh, I think I've become more of a vlog at this point. So my most recent video is, am I a horror vlog? <laughs> I'm, I'm just giving updates on my collection at this point. <laughs> and? Well, not, nothing uh, nothing wrong with that. I mean, I uh, for my show, it's kind of part, you know, collection updates and also... Some movie reviews like Hidden Horror Gems and also just kind of thematic overviews of, you know, horror. And they all kind of take on somewhat of a vlog feel. So nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I think what I might do is I might just pick a shelf and take stuff down off it and just talk about like, okay, here's what's on shelf one. Why not? Well... It'd be very time consuming, but hey, all we got now is nothing but time here in yeah, that's what I'm doing. Hell <laughs> well, I mean I uh I um for the things that I've done, like I just kinda think of like, okay, thematically what do I want to talk about and then just grab ones that are related to that. Like I did my shark movies one, I did found footage, and then if it's something like a specific underrated movie I did, Untraceable or Oculus, you know, I might do other ones. Uh, just kind of whatever I feel like doing at the time and also whether or not I'm, I can sleep, you know, because when I can't sleep, I usually do uh, ones that are more of those, like, overview of, like, cannibal films or whatever. 
Oh, that's a good idea. So, oh yeah, why don't you tell us about your channel, Dean? Why not? Um, so I'm Dane Kyle, aka Dane Demarung, on YouTube, and I am on a channel called Indie Horror Film Creative, where I do a show called Blu-ray Views, where I take the audience on a journey through rebuilding my Blu-ray collection, which I'm very happy to say is is in fact bigger and better than it was um, back, you know, at the time when I had to sell it all off for my fiance who horrifically betrayed me in all kinds of ways and thankfully now things are better than they were in the collection department but then I'm also just taking people on the journey with me and um, you know so I'll do just unboxings of whatever came in the mail that day um, as well as just overviews of like whatever my collecting philosophy is or like History of cannibal films. Um, you know, I talked about um, what horror films can teach us about the subject of romance, both good and bad. Uh, why I love shark movies, uh, controversial films of various sorts. Uh, the time that I saw a shadow person in real life, in in coordination with the film Shadow People, which came in the mail that day. Um, just kind of whatever I feel like that's on that general topic, and that's. Uh, independent of the film work that I do, which uh, has unfortunately uh, been put on pause because of the fact that we are still in the midst of the corona apocalypse. Okay. Um, Mo, why don't you go? Uh, my name is Mosley. I do videos for my channel, Drunken Master Studios. Recently did a video on the Italian slasher flick Torso. It's a good time. Enjoyed watching that immensely. Probably going to watch it again tomorrow, actually. Uh, and then I'm going to be doing one on Jungle Holocaust and Zombie Holocaust. And I might revisit Cannibal Holocaust. And, you know, then we're going to have a little cannibal apocalypse over there. It's all types of cannibals and zombies. That's that's what I'm going to be doing while I procrastinate my Lone Wolf and Cub series. So I will get that third one out, Brandon. Have, have you watched right. the cannibal uh, films one that I did? Because I talked about Jungle Holocaust, actually, and Cannibal mm, Holocaust. Yeah, but I'm definitely, as soon as you said that, it piqued my interest. I must have missed oh, that. Post, I'm gonna but... send, it, send it right now, and uh, that might help guide the conversation a bit, because I talk about uh, that one, um, Cannibal Holocaust, Cannibal Ferox, Emmanuel and the Last Cannibals, The Green Inferno, um, oh. and also the Hannibal Lecter film series, because, well, you kind of got to get that out of the way. Oh, yeah, hmm. yeah I just, uh, recently, I never really, I think I read about it at some point that Diodato had his cannibal trilogy or whatever. So like Jungle Holocaust is like the new hope of his little fucked up Star Wars trilogy there. And yeah, something like that. It's, it's Jungle Holocaust, Cannibal Holocaust, and then Cut and Run. I don't know why they didn't continue the title theme there, but. Uh, yeah, so I've got that on order, and then Man from Deep River is one that I've been meaning to get for a bit, so I'm pretty stoked uh, to have those in. Then te technically, Jungle Holocaust is not the title that shows up on the screen, at least not the one that I have, the yeah. code red one. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, Last Cannibal World. So, it, you know, the, the Holocaust thing was clearly like a retroactive thing. Yeah, I just don't know why they didn't do it with Cut and Run. <laughs> that, that one just yeah, doesn't. Yeah, you know, whenever I hear... Like cannibal holocaust or something like that. I just think of that Simpsons joke. It's like, oh, I get it. The movies have opposite names, so I'm sure I'll love Chernobyl Graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Uh, she steps out oh. of the theater. I didn't. <laughs> actually, uh, with Mo, uh, I'm going to follow up his because some of the stuff I have actually attaches to his channel. Uh, which, of course, I'm Septim Sin of Septim Sin versus the World. Uh, of course, we are uh, movie lovers on that channel about the collecting and, uh, of course, uh, just appreciation of physical media. Now, uh, main, uh, our main focus is on uh, new, vi new media videos. Now, our upcoming videos have gotten to be very long because we've gotten to be uh, more reliable on our sources, and that means that we cover quite a few things that are being released. But uh, if you don't want to uh, sit and watch the uh, two-hour explanation as we go through each one, uh, uh, there's 
we always at the very beginning make sure to give you a good slideshow so you can see what's coming out a week ahead so you can reserve what you want. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, we also do pickup videos and uh, I do reviews on the channel as well as um, these uh, movie strolls where I talk about basically 10 items from my collection with the most recent being a TV stroll where I had to focus on uh, Family Guy for most of it because there's so much of the darn thing. Um, mm. And uh, we also have uh, our weekly, we try to do vlog casts where we just kind of shoot the, shoot the shit, as, uh, so to speak. Uh, but we do a monthly anime uh, discussion. Uh, this month at the end of the month is going to be Higarashi or When They Cry, which is a horror anime, um, two seasons plus an OVA. So it's going to be very fun. I hope you all will join us there. Mm -hmm. Of course, we also partner with Inside Movies Galore, and I help with the organization. So next week, we continue our superhero summer with two lovely films. For our pre-show, we have Shazam, the DC Universe film, which Hell I'm yeah. looking forward to watching again on my Steelbook. It's and, so good. And uh, then I have, then of course we have the great, and in my opinion, underappreciated film, which Brad Sykes was talking about just the other day, Dark Man, which uh, is a, uh. a wonderful one. I can't wait to break out my trilogy and just get to town on that. I hope uh, we so we've got like a, two excellent movies, but we have finally decided on a theme for August, which is why I say it ties to uh, Mo's channel because he's been doing Kaiju Quarantine, which is such a great title and it's very sad I can't use it, but we are going to be calling next month Kaiju Combat with a K because you got to be cool in that 90s way. And uh, we're going to be covering all sorts of Kaiju fun on that month yes. so uh yes. after superheroes we're gonna be talking about big monsters beating the crap out of each other it's gonna be awesome definitely make up for that cg bullshit at the end of this movie i'll tell you <laughs> yeah it's oh. funny that i i made the joke about uh this film having as much thematic resonance as Superman, and yet we've talked about this movie for longer. <laughs> oh, I, there is there is one last thing I do want to point out about the Power Rangers movie. Uh, it has like the craziest final ultimate attack, like oh yeah, you've ever seen. Oh yeah, put them in a comment. <laughs> well, no, the they have this huge, huge panel like for emergency use only. They break the glass. Oh, they hit yeah. the button. You know what the button does? Kicks the villain in the crotch, and it's like, yeah. Yeah. well, yeah. you know, it uh, never fails, does it? Yeah, it's true. That's why you save it for kicks emergency. Kicks his ass into a comet, <laughs> right in the crotch. So, is the Gamera set still due out in August? I, uh, I believe I so. so. I still need to order it. Yeah, last um, time I checked, that's gonna be uh, awesome. And I, I still course, need to finish the Godzilla <laughs> set. Like it's so massive. <clears throat> Indeed. Yeah. You got some excuses right here. Right. <laughs> now, of course, in Kotobuki Jake, I am also on Septum Sim vs. the World and uh, very much looking forward to the uh, Higurashi discussion. I surely hope I get to rewatch everything in time. A lot of I'm stuff going on. Week. No, I've already started, but un unlike some people here, apparently, time is not excessive by any means. Yeah, uh, but not anyway, for me uh, either. <laughs> I like, will. Uh, I get up. To... I go to the gym, and then I just can't figure out what to do with myself. And I try to fall asleep at like three in the afternoon because it's like, well, uh, I get up and go to the gym again. Yeah. Uh, first yeah, first world, like first world for, problems. Uh, yeah. 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 At least you're not like me who's waiting for test results to come back exactly. to work. Exactly. To go back to work. <laughs> Which yeah. I thought that, had that because you're working med uh, work in the medical field, you would get that like right away, you know. Uh, <laughs> no, uh <laughs> now, there's no getting a test right away. It's just not set up that way. Not in the private sector, no. <laughs> no. no. All right. All right. So, Lead hey. us out, Dave. Uh, did you go, Jake? Yeah, more or less. 
I didn't have much to say in it. Okay. Uh, well, my name is David Stregge. I am one of the founding fathers of this uh, uh, relatively retrospective group of uh, discussing films. And I thank you all for the levels of depravity that we have gone. And uh, I thoroughly Ooh, enjoyed it through and through. So, uh, so thank you. And uh, But I also moonlight under a different channel. Uh, called uh, Delusions of Grandeur, where I do have a new vid a video pickup uh, coll a collection video out, th out there uh, for y'all to check out uh, some of the stuff that I picked up for the last mo a month or, uh, or so. Um, uh, but I'll de probably have another one coming up <laughs> uh, eventually. So, uh, so keep a lookout for those. I do need to get back into re uh, reviewing. It's been several weeks just had, had been kind of a standstill on that with this coronavirus go, uh, going on. <laughs> but uh, in any case, hopefully you can check out some of my older reviews and uh, maybe get inspired to uh, watch some of these uh, crazy films. So, in any case, uh, thank you for listening. Have a great day, evening, and mo morning. And don't go Power Rangers! Okay. <laughs> Dragon, Dragon. Dragon sword. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>